recording up and running again. Uh, hello, everybody, and happy Leap Day 2024. Uh, welcome to Leap into McGirt. Uh, McGirt is the Map and Geospatial Information Roundtable of the American Library Association. Uh, my name is Tim Kaiser. I'm currently the chair of McGirt. Uh, I'm also catalog librarian for cartographic resources at Michigan State University. Um, today, uh, for our events today, I'll be joined by uh, McGirt Secretary Laura McElfresh of the University of Minnesota, our, our past chair Kevin Dyke of Oklahoma State University, uh, our vice chair Aaron Cheever of the UL Research Institutes, and uh, Maggie Tarmy, our social media uh, coordinator, and uh, Maggie is from UCLA. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our format today. Uh, our lineup includes 13 presentations uh, split among three sessions. Let me put in the chat once more the schedule. Um, there will be a brief break at the end of the first two sessions. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions and discussion for the end of each of the three sessions. And that's to make sure that everybody has a chance to present. Uh, you're welcome to submit questions or comments via chat or by raising your hand during the question time. Uh, there is one exception to this structure, and that is our opening panel, uh, uh, be because our uh, panelists have formatted uh, their presentation to include some live discussion. Uh, for our presenters, we'll be using the Zoom countdown timer to help us uh, help keep us on track. Um, You'll be able to see it while you're sh while you are screen sharing uh, your slides if you have them. Uh, the plan for now is that I will be the one to uh, who has to remember to start the timer, and we'll see if I do a good job of that, and maybe we'll have to reconsider. Uh, but I, we'll give it a try. Uh, for our opening session, uh, I'll be moderating. Uh, we'll have Kevin monitoring the chat, and we also have Laura on hand to assist as needed. So with that, I will turn it over to our opening panel, uh, The Need to Weed, a panel on paper map deaccessioning uh, with Janet Reyes of the University of California, Riverside, Chris Thury of the Colorado School of Mines, and Martin Chandler of Cape Breton University. And I believe Chris is first. Yeah, good morning, everybody. You can hear me? Tim, you can hear me? Okay, great. Uh, it's uh, great to, to be here on uh, Leap Day. Uh, as Tim said, my name is Chris Theory. I'm the Map and GIS Librarian at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm going to be co-presenting uh, with Martin Chandler, a, a man I sincerely believe is seven feet tall because I've never met him in person, uh, from Cape, Cape Breton University in Canada, and Janet Reyes from the University of California at Riverside. Uh, here's a quick outline of what we'll be talking about. I'm going to lead it off and talk about why we think... Uh, uh, Weeding is a good thing, how to talk to other people about it, uh, collection development policies, and then some general thoughts on some weeding plants. Martin's gonna go into that a little more detailed. He's gonna talk about crafting criteria, collection policies, and AI. And finally, Janet's gonna get down to some of the nitty gritty of uh, processes and downsizing and formulate procedures. So why is this a good topic? Why is this uh, good to talk about now? Now, we we have all heard the horror stories of map collections being gutted, and we're not talking about from fires or floods. We're talking about huge map collections or slices of map collections being disposed of, not just hundreds, but tens of thousands. And they're done, these massive weeding projects are done by people from outside of uh, the map librarian uh, profession. They're done by librarians or administrators who really don't understand map, the value of a paper map collection. And I think all of us worry about that, that some arbitrary decision is going to come down from on high that's going to deem a map collection, a physical map collection, too big and its size must be reduced and reduced quickly. And we all know one of the big arguments right now is that space has become imperative. So how do we think about this proactively? How can we get ahead of this? Well, we argue that one of the things that you can do is have a plan in place. And who else to come up with a plan to, we to do a massive weeding of your collection is you. You know your collection. You work with your collection. Who's better to, uh, to weed my collection? Me, who's been here 28 years, or someone who steps in the day after I retire, which is not going to happen for a long time, and goes through and, and guts the collection. 
Um, downsizing your collection does not make it worse. I We topped off at 211,000 maps at one point, and I weeded heavily twice, got down to 163,000 maps, and now I'm back up to 165,000. And I would argue that my collection is better now, in better shape than it was at the time uh, we had the most maps. And I also think it might be time to do another big weed. And weeding is a chance for you to really evaluate in depth your collection. Things change over time. Your users, the people doing research, the space and the space needs of, uh, of your organization changes over time. But how do we talk to people? How do we talk to people so they don't just walk in and say, get rid of everything, you're welcome to keep five drawers. How do we make people understand the value of a paper map collection? How do we keep the good stuff? Um, I think all of us here attending this meeting would agree that maps have value to, paper maps have value to researchers, instructors, and even casual users. And one of the things that's our job really is to connect people with the physical items in our collection. And how do we do that? Well, uh, there's some, some good arguments, how to make good arguments about things you need to keep. And first of all, is to have all your maps being constantly used. If there are people around using your collection, kind of tough to get rid of because it's important to them. Also great to have statistics to show people, not just anecdotes. And lastly, uh, and then what is available physically, only physically in your collection is not available digitally. And lastly, knowing who your users are. Is it a particular department or a segment of your population? And conversely, kind of the flip side, same, same thing of how to talk to people about doing a weed and what you can get rid of is kind of the same thing. It's just the flip side is what's unused and taking up a lot of room in your collection. Do you have statistics that bear that out? What's available digitally that you could probably get rid of and use, uh, have available digitally? And lastly, to know who your users are. So the first step I think you need before you start doing a weed is to actually have a collection development policy for your maps specifically. And you wanna build that collection development policy in close concert and to enhance the library's mission and goals. And it should be pretty general just to give yourself a lot of flexibility. So in a collection development policy, you know, we kind of know this, but just a reminder for maps, uh, you want to identify who the users are, who your audience is, how it fits into the collection in general. It's really important, I think, in a collection development policy for maps to define the scope, the ge various scopes, geographic scope, subject scope, date and chronology. All these are up to you. You don't have to take it from other people. You get to decide these things. You might want to mention in a collection development policy something about um, formats. Are you going to keep CD-ROMs? Scales, are you going to keep things small scale, large scale, and language? Are you going to keep anything but English, other languages? And things that you have to include for your collection development policy are, this is important, who's responsible for these choices? Is it you? I hope it's you. Or is it some other collection development group? Are there ex, uh, exceptions to any rule you have? For example, I collect everything Colorado. doesn't matter the subject. What are you not going to collect? I think that's a big deal to say that. We don't collect nautical charts here in Colorado. Are you going to keep duplicates? If so, which ones, how many? And lastly, put right in your collection development policy, what do you do with discards? So Martin and Janet are going to go into this a little more, uh, a little more deeply, but I'm just going to say about making a plan to weed. I have in my files plans ready to roll right now for 10, 15, 20% of the collection to be pitched. So they can walk in, the nebulous they can walk in and say, you got to get rid of it. I will have a good cry, but I can start on it fairly quickly. So as I suggest you do that too. Come up with a proactive plan of doing a massive weed. 
And some of the first things you're going to have to do is do the math. Know what you have. To make all your measurements, how much square footage, how many map cases, et cetera, and have a variety of scenarios ready to roll and what they're going to mean to the map collection and the library as a whole. And lastly, really important, let everybody know this plan exists so that they're just not operating in a vacuum. That's what I have. I'm going to hand it off to Martin now. Stop sharing. All right, there we go. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and hi, everyone. I'm Martin. I am I'm your representative Canadian here at the, the ALA McGirt uh, event. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the criteria for weeding and some of the things that are uh, good to think about, good to know about, good to just think rather deeply about. Um, as mentioned, I'm at Cape Breton University, which if you're wondering where that is, it is right here on this map, uh, way off in the in the not quite the far corner of, of Canada, but pretty close to, uh, if you don't know where Cape Breton is. I spent a few years in the U.S. and would say I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and people asked if that was near Toronto. It is, it, it's not, but, but it is also in some ways. Anyway, I won't go too far into that. Shameless plug, uh, I did write a paper about weeding map libraries uh, for the academic map librarian, at least. So if you're looking to do that, uh, the paper exists. You can also reach out to me at any point in time and I can send it to you. Uh, uh, and as Chris mentioned, uh, you'll want a collections policy. Um, just bear in mind that that taking that developing a collections policy does take time. It is, I've found an iterative process. So you might start with one idea in mind. Then if you actually get into the weeding, that'll sort of change as you go along, go back, relook at it, kind of shift over time. Be okay with that. Know that it's going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of thinking, and, and just rethinking and rethinking and, and do that sort of that iterative process. Uh, but it's easier if you know that it's coming. Uh, so that big question, does your institution have a collections policy? Does it include maps? Is it current? Has it been done recently? Has, uh, does it include local needs? Does it include historical longevity? Uh, and I threw in a map here of Cape Breton because uh, not for any particular reason other than it's a nice map and it's interesting and I like it. Uh, some important things to consider, even if something is low use, materials may not exist outside of where you are. So I mentioned that kind of local needs. Uh, local users may not just be institutional, they could be uh, in the community more generally. Uh, and this might involve some outreach to other institutions in the area to work collaboratively on, on what you might need to, to think about either retaining or, or getting rid of. So there's a whole lot of uh, whole lot of stuff there. Um, and as an example of this, uh, there's a place in Nova Scotia called Ecom Uh It's a very, very small town, uh, village really. Um, and if you were to go looking for, for information about that at, say, the University of Toronto, the biggest university in Canada, um, there is very little. Uh, similarly, for a place called Mushaboom, uh, there's another place called Shag Harbor. Uh, I did the search for Shag Harbor, University of Toronto. There are seven items there, uh, whereas at Dalhousie, there are about 2,000. Dalhousie is the, the one in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So if it exists elsewhere, uh, that's great. Uh, it, it, it may not, though, especially in your largest institutions. So you might want to just check on these things because they may not collect for that. Uh, now, Chris mentioned usage, and uh, I have all kinds of thoughts about usage, and I have more the more I think about it. Um, I find ideas of use in maps can be uh, can be challenging sometimes. Um, yeah, as a criteria, it can be suspect in general. We've we all sort of know about this in terms of reading, but they can be required, um, and they also require a temporal philosophy. So, like the the overall time that we're thinking about um, in terms of keeping something. When is it no longer useful? When do we know it's not useful long-term? Um, was I here? Uh, yeah, so documentation on usage. Uh, how do we keep that? How is it, how is it managed? Is it just a, a paper that you have that you say like, yes, this map, somebody was looking at it and I had to refile it, all of that, that kind of thing. And then there's a the question of duplicates. Do you need duplicates? Should you get rid of everything that is not a, or that is a duplicate uh, and only have one copy? Or do people need multiple copies? What's going on there? There's, there's a lot of sort of contextual things with every single item, right? So we have to, to think about all of that stuff. 
Then the question of, is it useful but unused? Uh, why is it useful or why is it unused? Can you promote its use? Uh, timelines, again, sort of temporal philosophy here. Timelines can be elastic. Uh, you, some might see 10 years and as no longer used as a good thing to get rid of, but we can also think 25 years or 50 years, or we could think five years if it's not used in five years. So uh, that's, a, that's a big debate to be had, I think, um, with, with those folks who are pushing for this weed. Um, I tend to, in my own weeding, think kind of longer term uh, and keep that, that tension in my mind about, you know, what is useful now versus what is going to be useful longer term and, and how does that space fit into that, that philosophy of, of time and, and use. Uh, and local materials may often be less used depending on where you are, but you may be the only one who has it. As I mentioned, like Shag Harbor, there's not a lot about Shag Harbor. It's a, it's a tiny little village, but if you look into it, and I keep mentioning Shag Harbor, um, it's the site of Canada's most well-documented UFO crash. So if you're interested in UFOs, Shag Harbor, uh, you're welcome for that. Uh, I won't go too much more into my whole time thing, but we can talk about this if you have questions. Uh, but I'll move forward to just considering ideas of the beautiful. Uh, so data usage things are a tool. They're not a, a full answer to things. Sometimes a low use but absolutely beautiful map can be kept simply because it's a beautiful map. Uh, and I think that's okay. I think it's an excellent reason. Uh, I come to, to this world from an arts background. I, I think about aesthetics a lot as well. So um, be okay with the beautiful. As an example, I really like this map. Uh, it's not particularly useful. It's a map of Sydney, Nova Scotia in Cape Breton. Um, it's an older one, kind of gives some ideas of, of where things were, but there's other maps that show that better. Uh, but it's still, I think, a, quite a lovely map. So I would keep it regardless. Um, I'm going to skip past this because I'm running short on time, and I wanted to get to this new part, this whole idea of artificial intelligence or machine learning that we've all been kind of hearing about, dealing with. Um, and this, this idea that's come to me of like, will AI eventually be trustworthy? Is it trustworthy now? Or will it undermine the entire idea of trustworthiness of digital information just because of the way things go? Is it, a, as I say, an Aladdin-style genie or a monkey's paw? Um, so here's a here's an AI generated uh, topographic. Well, I told it to give a topographic map. It's it's not really, but uh, AI generated map of the United States if it were to take over part of Canada. Here's another one. This one was got a little bit closer, but not quite there yet. Uh, does some funny things, as you can see. Alaska has kind of uh, been cut off here. Um, Nova Scotia, where I am, is, is questionable over here. The mountains are all kinds of things going on there, too. But uh, this is what it generated. And Greenland is now uh, United Canada. Here's another AI-generated map. Again, Alaska's sort of cut off. East coast of Canada is on all, all kind of wonky. Labrador here is OK, but Newfoundland is just sort of spread over and joined the mainland almost. Nova Scotia is gone. It's a whole thing. Um, and then I said, what, what would it be like if the US invaded Canada? And here's what it gave me. It's actually a lot closer to what we would see normally. Although again, Nova Scotia is not doing so well in these things. Um, Cape Breton has really sort of disappeared here. Uh, and then this is one that it generated as well, which was uh, exploring the topography of the Great White North of Canada, discover Canada's provinces. Um, and it, it created this map that looks a lot more like Japan. Uh, so so questionable things going on there. Um, so I have some more things, uh, but I will save those for, for any questions and discussion. And I will now hand it over uh, to Janet. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Um, well, thank you both, Chris and Martin, for talking about the things that set the stage for uh, the actual logistics of um, weeding a map collection, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next couple of minutes. Let's First, let's think about who manages map collections these days. 
Uh, we love it when it's individuals trained and experienced in map li librarianship. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? But sometimes that's not what's happening. A lot of times it's librarians or library staff who got um, kind of handed this extra responsibility or a new responsibility, and they don't really have much experience with maps. Sometimes it's somebody who came to the library with a background in GIS or maybe data science and the administrators say, well, close enough, now you're managing the map collection, right? And you have to, to uh, cut it down to size. So that can happen. And for all of these groups of people, um, they may have a range of project management experience. And I think that's important because downsizing a map collection is a project and there's lots of moving pieces and it just really helps if you have some idea of how to, to manage that through from start to finish. Um, so processes in downsizing a map collection, I've got the first two grayed out because Chris and Martin have already covered those uh, fairly well or some considerations in doing that. Um, but then when it's time to get going, what you need to do is establish the procedures you're going to use, then test out those workflows that you think might work and also write up methodologies because you're probably going to have helpers who may not remember everything or understand everything. So having it written down is, I think, super important. Um, and then go ahead and implement those procedures. Do the things to see how it turns out. And uh, don't be afraid to revise some things that seemed great in concept may not work when it's uh, in practical matters. So uh, really be flexible on what you've devised for your workflows. Um, it helps to monitor progress so you know when to maybe ask for more resources or time, uh, if you especially if you have a hard deadline of when you need to finish. And then um, obviously the, the goal of this is to route items in your current collection to their final destination, whether they're keepers that go back in the drawer or back on the shelf, whether they are going to be respectfully disposed, or if there's like this middle ground where you can't keep them, but you can find somebody else who would give them a happy home. And that's what I call dispersing the items. And um, in my experience, that happened quite a bit with what I could not keep in my collection. Um, and then at my last bullet point there is most of the time, or I think almost all of, of the time, when you downsize a map collection to a significant extent, it usually comes along with moving it somewhere else or reconfiguring the footprint of where it currently exists to allow more space for other things to happen. So, and all of that has a lot of um, procedural things to think about as well. This slide gives a little bit more about the procedures and workflows. Um, the graphic on the left is something I came up with that's just kind of a general overview. You're gonna assess the materials. You're gonna decide whether they're keepers or you're gonna let them go. If they're keepers, sometimes there's things you need to do or can do to prepare them for keeping. Maybe if something's damaged and you want it to um, go into conservation or something like that before, they get rehoused either back in the drawer or back on the shelf, where whatever it may be. If you're gonna let them go, there's things that you need to do to get them ready for removing them from your collection before they end up in, your, in the final destination, whether that's um, dispersal or disposal. And several of workflows may be needed for any of these components in that, those blue shapes because you have different types of items, right? Uh, whether it's cataloged, whether it's classified, by which I mean um, has a call number on it. Um, is it an individual thing or is it part of a series? And then um, also if they are depository items, uh, there's a special protocol that goes along with that. If it came to your library through a depository system in the United States, we have the FDLP, I believe in Canada, it's called the DSP. Um, so you need to be aware of what those protocols are and how your library follows them. So here's a photo of the former map collection um, in the UCR Warbox Science Library. It was out of the way, not used very much. We had over 100,000 sheet maps, only a small percentage of them were cataloged. And during the review process I went through in um, 2018, 2019, we downsized from 625 to 270 map drawers. At the same time, I was able to add more than 2,000 sheet maps to the catalog that were previously uncatalogued. So. Um, and like Chris alluded to, I think my collection, our collection is better uh, for having been weeded. Um, and here's shameless plug number two. I felt I could not pass up the opportunity to just mention that last year, uh, this workbook came out uh, for conducting a map collection review based on the experiences I had. 
um, lots of nitty gritty detail -y kind of things in there. And so if you are facing this task, perhaps you would like to uh, download it. It's for free. And there's the, uh, the link for uh, finding it. And that's it. Uh, all three of us, thank you. Um, there's our contact information if you are interested in reaching out to us later. But in the meantime, we now get to the fun part of the panel, which is um, answering your questions. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, mm -hmm. Janet. Um, it's Chris again. And we uh, asked you all in um, registering to if you had any questions for us. And we did have a few, so I'd like to kind of handle those first before we get to uh, any that you want to put in the chat or raise raise your hand or however you want to do that. So the first question I have um, is kind of for Janet and you you talked about it. Um, where should maps go when they leave the, collide, uh, the collection and you don't have a secure home for them, waiting for them? What should you do with those? Yeah, I, I can interpret that question a couple different ways, like whether you want to keep them out of the way on hold until they do find a place to go, or if it's like really, really can't keep them, um, what are we going to do with them, right? So um, I like the option of dispersing them if you can. Uh, lots of other departments in your institution might be interested. I gave away quite a lot of things to the history department. Um, even things like your makerspace, um, that's going to consume the, the map or whatever, but still they could use it, the art department. Um, the theater department sometimes need wall maps and globes and things like that, all kinds of things like that. Um, and even campus uh, departments like um, our international uh, program for students to go overseas, they wanted all a lot of the, um, you know, the roadmaps for overseas locations and things. So there's that option. You can also look at other institutions in your area or collections that you know that have that specialty and for the, the things that you're uh, not going to be able to keep. And then uh, sometimes personal um, collections, like um, at my institution, the raised relief maps that were really popular. People always think they're cool, and they were just so happy <laughs> to be able to get one of a, an area that meant a lot to them. So um, I encourage people to look for those kind of um, places where they could end up being a happy home. And then of course there, there is the recycle bin um, if all, all else fails. So I hope that addressed the question a little bit. Um, and Martin, I don't know if you can handle this one or, or kick to the other. How, how are people relying on digital editions of maps and how does that influence weeding? Uh, if something is scanned, you no longer need it or how is that playing into your your thinking yeah i think that ends up being sort of a, a lot of the the idea behind space as well as like oh we don't have it here or people aren't using it because they're going to the digital side um and it's very useful in that respect uh i don't know i might i'm probably going to to paint myself as a, as a bit of a Luddite when I say that the digital is really great um, and there's all kinds of things you can do with it. I'm not yet fully of the the idea that things will stay around long enough, even even like the government maps that make themselves uh, available that are so wildly available. Um, at least here are in Canada, the government maps are all there. But there's still that part of me that is slightly mistrustful of it always being there. And that that also comes from kind of data side of things. Um, there's data that is there that is available, but then there's stuff that used to be there and isn't there anymore or gets corrupted or things like that. Um, so so there's that whole sort of realm of things. And then uh, I have worked with with some faculty members who have said that, you know, yeah, the digital is great and it's very useful. We can show things more easily, but it's also not quite the same sort of enjoyment for themselves and students. And I've seen this with students as well who are starting to now ask for the physical book. And I'm like, well, we have it as an ebook. You can access that anywhere. And they say, yeah, but I want to take, I want one to take home or I want one to to see and to hold and to deal with because because of all the time that they spend on everything digital, especially after the pandemic. So it's like there's that sort of two-edged sword of yeah, the digital is great and useful, and it, we can do so much with it. At the same time, we do so much with it that 
people are starting to push a little bit the other direction too. Um, yeah, that's that's a very much like a not really answering your question at all. I think in in all kinds of fun ways. <laughs> um, so I I looked in a kind of a question that uh, I think I can handle. Well, what do you do with uh, stakeholders who are adamant about you can't get rid of these things? There, you can't get rid of the maps, and uh, but you have strong arguments for weeding the maps. And one of the things I talk about with people, I talk about uh, when I walk around campus and talk to professors, is that we use statistics, not anecdotes. And I've had people, when I got rid of my uh, east of the Mississippi topos for the United States, I had several people, oh, you can't get rid of it. I'm like, in 10 years, I had two maps of the entire Eastern United States checked out. The, the, it just doesn't justify taking up, you know, a hundred drawers or whatever it took up. Um, also, I like to play, I like to butter people and also, you know, sugarcoat and tell small lies and say something to the effect of, well, they, the nebulous, they, want to get rid of so much more, but I being the good the good librarian and able to preserve those little corners here. They wanted to get rid of 90%, but I was only, I was able to talk them down to 60%. So, um, you know, then, then you know, you're playing the, you're being the good guy, even though <laughs> it's kind of a lie, but it's, it still works, it's pretty effective. I'm not sure if people have some questions they have for us to put in the chat or want to chime in. We do have some other questions we can get to, um, but wondering if people in the audience. I have a question. This is Tim. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about maps, it, it, I, I, I guess I... I feel like I'm seeing a pattern that has played out in various other areas of human endeavor where there's a nadir of interest in something that then picks back up. And the most recent phenomenon where I remember seeing this was, you know, working in, I, before I was a uh, librarian, I was a paraprofessional in a, a art school library that I had gone where I had been a student in that art school library. So I uh, went, you know, looking at their vinyl collection. I remember, you know, they were kind of popular when I was a student in the 90s. And then I started working in the library and we started having that experience of it's been 10 years and we've had two checkouts. We should get rid of this. And then just before we moved on that, suddenly the 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 younger generation was coming in and discovering them and loved them we're just absolutely gaga over this collection and i see that happening in you know trends in art you know museums try to buy you know uh, you know i i've seen <laughs> or i guess i i i i think of museums buying art at the nadir of its interest in a particular artistic movement where, you know, just in terms of art history, it's looked down upon for a period of time and then gets rediscovered in the painting that they bought for a, a pittance in 1920 becomes a, a superstar of the collection. Um, I guess I think of that a lot with maps and I think of it as I'm cataloging maps and I'm looking at, you know, a 1994 AAA roadmap of some state and thinking, boy, there's nothing less interesting than this. And then, but then I remind myself, well, if the, you know, the 1965 map of that same state is kind of interesting now. And uh, I don't know. I just wonder, I know Martin kind of uh, uh, moved past the topic of uh, uh, the time period of a collection, but I, I wonder if it, if that, prompts any uh uh if you have any uh, thoughts on that big uh, word salad <laughs> well I'll, I'll just tell you anecdotally that i heard through um that someone said the best way to create a a, a fantastic collection in the future is to collect right now 
and that you, we all can point to, wouldn't it be cool to have those 1930 roadmaps of your state? Well, you can maybe find them for a high price these days, but you, you know, the ones right now, you pick them up and 50 years from now, they're going to be worth something. I think what's important is to define, uh, to have that collection development policy to say, what are you collecting? Right. Those those triple A roadmaps. Maybe you do have a great roadmap collection and that's important for a variety of reasons to you. But for example, for me, I I look at the geography and say, OK, Colorado, take everything Colorado doesn't matter the topic. But if somebody walks in with a bunch of, you know, I uh, hands me a, a nice collection of roadmaps of Michigan. Tim, you're going to get a call from me because I. I, I don't have the space, time, or need to keep those things. And so I think it's kind of incumbent upon all of us to keep the subjects in our areas, uh, you know, that way, not that, you know, because we can't keep, all keep everything. John, go ahead, John Clark. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thanks for, uh, you know, really thought provoking uh, talks from from all of you. Um, I really like Tim's point. Uh, I mean, if we start with the assumption that that uh, librarianship and lots of other people are going to that demand is what counts. You know, what people want now is should be driving most of our collection decisions. And I think we would all hesitate to endorse that, but in fact, that really is what uh, a lot of the institutional top-down kind of uh, um, is driving decision-making in collections in general, uh, as well as the uh, debate over physicality versus other uses of library space, uh, which I'm struggling with at my library right now. So Tim makes a very good point that what's popular now is not necessarily popular in 10 years. So first of all, you're introducing, you know, that, uh, you know, a temporal kind of element into that equation when you buy that pure kind of neoliberal idea that if, if it's not in demand now, um, we don't need it. The second thing is I'd make a case for ubiquity. In other words, the assumption that demand now the experience, the utility, as my economics professor father would call it, of every single user is the same is not necessarily true. And I'll give an example of the Bangor Public Library in the 90s when I was a young man living in Bangor, Maine. They had an endowment from lumber barons, which made it the second largest circulating library in New England after Boston. And essentially for about a hundred years up to the 1990s, they didn't deaccession anything. And that's an extreme case of, of uh, they had plenty of physical space, Stephen and Tabitha King, the writers uh, gave them $10 million to just house everything. And uh, it was like being a kid in a candy store. What it meant was that they had everything. Um, you went into one section of the stacks and they had bought the Boston Cooking School cookbook from the first edition when Fannie Farmer first started publishing her school's cookbooks all the way for, you know, I don't know, 100 years or so in the 1890s. I went back there just uh, last fall and, uh, yeah, they have three Fannie Farmers now. And so there's something to be said for the experience of, of a user knowing that something obscure is there something that other people don't want and sometimes that has more utility to that particular user than somebody who's just going in on a you know on on with much less intensity in intentionality in their library use um i don't know if i'm making a lot of sense but I, i'll call it ubiquity and that that is a collection goal of having a, a lot of different categories of knowledge in your collection, whether it's maps or books or what have you. Um, and that leaves the demand side out of it. That brings the librarian and the collection managers right back to the forefront, because then they're, the users are relying on us to come up with categories of collections that need to be filled regardless of whether anybody wants to see them in the next 10 years. 
So that's my little pitch for physicality and hanging on to things. I'm glad I'm not a collections guy. All right. Th thanks, John. Uh, I do see a couple questions here in the chat. Uh, Joshua is asking, can someone share some examples of library stakeholders you work with when putting together a collection development policy, area study, librarian subjects, et cetera? So I don't know if Martin, you can address that a little bit. Yeah, I can I can talk about that at least because we're uh, we're developing a collection development policy right now just because our library hasn't. We're a fairly young university, so uh, we didn't have one for a long time. So now we're in the process of putting it together. Um, we're also very small at the moment. There's five librarians, so there's a fair bit of just conversation between us uh, talking about it because the liais liaisons are all very deeply involved in the collection development itself. So there's a lot of that. Um, we, I mean, I was going to say that we don't really ask too much outside of the library. We we take some of the ideas of our faculty members uh, as they come in, but we don't actively discuss collection development policies with those folks, um, either from the, the collection side or from the the deaccessioning side, I guess, uh, especially not the deaccessioning side, um, because there's so oh, because of all the the standard reasons of they don't necessarily know that we are trained professionals and and know what we're doing when we make these decisions, um, and so getting rid of something is very much a case of like you cannot do that. That's a it's a travesty and all the equivalencies thereof. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's very much a case I find I think of just knowing who the right people to talk to are. So when I was at uh, Brock University, which I was at before here, I also created a map collections development policy and kept that very much within the map library uh, until I needed to take it to the rest of the librarians at a library council and said, "Here's the the collection development policy for that. If anybody has thoughts or ideas, then then do voice them now." But um, it wasn't really a case of them being deeply involved in the map side of things. Right. Uh, looks like we only have about a minute left. I know there's one question we can get to maybe at the uh, very end of this uh, whole group of things about uh, state law and disposal of material, but Wang Wango has uh, his hand up. So something we can answer real quick. Um, thank you. Um, what are the things that I think uh, the we have not really discussed is about advocating for scanning before beating out. I think that is something we really need to talk. A beating is very easy, but advocating how to get those maps scanned before beating. For me, it looks like we are losing a lot of important materials taken out. And so if we cannot scan them properly, we will be missing after 50 years from now, the important material will be missing. So we have to think backward, I mean, in future, how people will use the material. And so I think we need to advocate that, that I didn't see in the talk much about advocating for scanning before reading. Just, just, just a comment, thank you. I'll pass it back to Tim and on to our next group. Our next person. Thank you, and uh, um, yes, let's let's we will uh, move on to our next presentation. But uh, we can hang on to these questions for time at, if when there's time at the end. I, I imagine there probably will be. Uh, but thank you very much. Let's a uh, virtual uh, round of applause for our uh, opening panel. That was uh, uh, a great presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Um, our next presentation is also on the topic of weeding, but a different uh, aspect. Uh, it's uh, a lightning talk by Michelle Colquitt of Clemson University, and it's titled Leaping into the Weeding, Weeding Maps After a Catastrophe. So I see, it, uh, Michelle, I can see your uh, slides, so I'll turn it Perfect. over to you. Perfect. And you can hear me okay? Thank you. Um, so my name is Michelle Colquitt and I'm the Continuing Resources and Government Information Management Librarian here at Clemson University Libraries. Um, I am also the Interim E-Resources Coordinator. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about weeding our maps after a catastrophe. Um, so a little bit of the agenda, just I'll give you a little bit of information about Clemson University Libraries, outline our December 2022 weather event, and then discuss the maps collection move as part of the larger government documents collection move. Um, I'll talk about the collaborative maps weeding program development um, developed in accordance with um, several of us across the libraries, and then talk about the actualities of weeding and then our future assessment. Um, so a little bit of information about Clemson. We have almost 29,000 students spread across undergrad and graduate. Um, we are a public R1 land grant institution in upstate South Carolina. Um, I don't know why, but sometimes I think people think that we're private, but we're not. Um, Cooper Library, which is pictured on the screen, is our heart of campus. Um, it's a beautiful mid-century modern building built in 1966, um, six floors with our collections currently or at the time spread across uh, the first, third and fifth floors. Um, we have several branches on campus. We have an offsite storage facility located about eight miles from campus. And then we also have a presence in, um, across the state of South Carolina. And of course, like everyone else, we are kind of at a space crunch and that's kind of why some things happened. Um, so in December 2022, we had um, an unprecedented weather event. If you'll remember, there was a cold snap all across the United States. Um, you're seeing on the screen here, um, we're up toward Greenville with the negative eight wind chill that is like completely out of our realm of possibility. <laughs> um, if we have weather like that, our, our place just kind of shuts down for a good long time. Um, so because of the cold snap, uh, we had several HVAC malfunctions. Um, even in the Cooper Library building, we had two different areas of concern. Um, one was on the fifth floor where our Starbucks location is located at. Um, it had an HVAC and it failed. Um, there was also, I believe, a sink issue where the sink overflowed or other things with the water. Um, that water ended up going down to the fourth floor, which um, we had a former server farm room there that had its own HVAC system that was just kind of notoriously known for, you know, terrible issues. Um, and all of the water from the fifth floor cascaded to the fourth and then cascaded down to the bottom floor. Um, thankfully, we didn't lose a lot of collections. I feel like we only lost like maybe 1,600 individual items. Um, but because of that, certain things had to move out, including the government documents and eventually the maps. Um, Campus-wide, we had 42 buildings that were um, damaged um, a little bit of foreshadowing. One of those buildings was um, our a couple different museums. We have a, a natural history museum and a geology museum. So that's a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, so talking about the government documents collection move, um, I was told in um, May of 2022, shortly after I was hired, that the government documents needed to move um, they could move somewhere in Cooper, or they could also move out to our um, offsite storage facility eight miles from campus. They just needed to move off the third floor because we had a learning commons that were, was opening. Um, so the government documents were comprised of approximately 9,500 square feet of stuff. Um, and I think that the maps collection was included because you know sometimes folks just like to shoehorn maps into government documents. And so these pictures here are pictures of the former maps room um, on the first floor at Cooper. Um, our maps collection evaluation, um, we have approximately 41,000 items in the collection and the, the great majority of which are cataloged hallelujah. Um, previous employees were very passionate about collecting and cataloging maps. Um, so things that we're seeing in the collection. Um, there are fake SUDOC numbers. Um, as you'll see right here, this is a county map of Oconee County, South Carolina, which is um, the next door neighbor county of uh, Clemson, which is in Pickens County. It has a fake SUDOC number on it, a U5.2. Um, we also have CIA maps. 
that are in binders, uh, maps of various countries, um, and then also the raised relief topographic maps, like the one up in the upper uh, right-hand corner is a map of Leadville, Colorado. Why? Like, it, I mean, other than it's cool, why do we have this? <laughs> Um, so weeding guidelines, um, in accordance with our um, group of folks, we've um, talked about different um, things that we're going to weed. Uh, we've worked together with the public facing government information librarian and uh, the government documents team. So I am the backside of that team. I am responsible for cataloging and my team is too. Um, so there are guidelines that we have developed is that, of course, we're going to keep everything in our ACERL Association of Southeastern Research Libraries, um, Centers of Excellence Collections. We maintain collections in A13, which is the Forestry Service, I-29 and I-49 National Parks and Fish and Wildlife. Um, we will keep everything South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And in those, we have South Carolina city maps, South Carolina traffic maps. Um, we also have coastal charts that are South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, but we're going to get rid of probably everything else. Um, CIA maps can be removed that are moved back into the stats and removed from their binders. Um, international maps, we're going to withdraw, withdraw the majority of those and make cases for what we'll like to keep. Um, also, with some of our South Carolina city maps, we have to go back and uh, reevaluate call numbers. As you saw earlier, you saw the fake SUDOC numbers. <clears throat> so our progress, we haven't made a ton of progress because of several different reasons. Uh, the technical infrastructure is kind of there, but as you'll see on this picture right here, um, our animal friends kept us from doing a lot of work. Um, I work pretty early in the morning, 7 a.m. I'm not saying that I thought there would be a night at the museum situation. I just, um, I have feelings about taxidermy and animals at museums and I did not want to go back and hang out with them early in the mornings. Um, so they have moved back to their homes, which um, I believe was the Natural Hum History Museum. So they moved back to their home and um, in summer 2024 and Ford, we're gonna focus on weeding the maps. Um, it hasn't been mandated that they be weeded, um, but we just kind of see the writing on the wall. Um, they are building a, a new depot building at some point in the future and also doing some pretty severe renovations on Cooper. And so we just know that kind of space is at a premium. So we're going to be mindful of that. And that's why we're weeding. Um, future plans. Definitely, we understand and reflect on the emotions of weeding. Um, there were some pretty big emotions in terms of the government documents move. Um, my staff has been here for a very long time, um, everyone basically over 25 years. Um, so they had some really big feelings with the government documents move. I definitely understand and respect that those feelings are there with um, weeding. So that's why we're going to make those informal check ins. And also, we as talked about before in the, the, the first session, we are gonna work on a um, collection development policy. We have that in the works and I do have my handy dandy weeding the map collection workbook here with me. Um, and then also we're gonna have celebrations. I definitely believe in celebrating and so we are gonna do that. Um, and then here are my references. And if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I love to talk about this. So thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, uh, a round of applause for Michelle. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with this um, so that others can benefit from what you learned. Uh, next, our, our last presentation in this session is a lightning talk by Sierra Ladisaw who uh, recently started at the University of Michigan. Hello, neighbor. Uh, and her presentation is titled, Managing a New to You Map Collection, Approaches to the First Month. So let's see, I'll ask uh, Michelle to stop sharing your screen so that Sierra can jump in. There we go, thank you. Awesome, okay. So as Tim said, I have recently begun a new position. I'm excited to say I'm back with maps. 
Um, so I am the new curator of maps and graphics at the Williams L. Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which you'll see one of our mini bird's eye views in the background of this title slide, which does show Ann Arbor. Um, I wanted to start by kind of giving you the what the collection is as advertised on our website. So the Clements Library has four divisions, maps, manuscripts, books, and graphics. The map division is approximately 30,000 maps and 500 atlases. The collection, um, as in the entire William Clements, is focused on the Americas broadly um, and really is on early exploration of the Americas through the early 20th century. The strengths in the map collection are pre-1820s Americas, um, the Revolutionary War, the Revolutionary War collection at the Clements at large is really, really incredible. 19th century travel maps, student maps created between about 1818 and 1895, and then 18 and 19th century city plans and fortification plans. But of course, as we all know, what we advertise on our website might not be the reality when you start getting into that collection. So I kind of have three things to frame my little talk here. And this is my first one. The important part is to ask questions. My first week in the building, I've been here just over a month now, I started asking for documentation. Things like, is there a collection development policy? Things like, are there policies around what we let readers have access to in our reading room? Um, and then I was also asking for things on, like, what have we historically been ordering to add to the collection? Or what have our donors been giving us to the collection? Um, this is Tiberius, sorry. <laughs> um, and starting going through that, it was really great to kind of see the ebb and flow and how the collection was developed what was maybe a focus for a 10 year period and where we shifted a focus to that gives me an idea of what has been added to it historically. The next question I was asking for was information on what were the researchers wanting? What has historically been the research questions coming in where maps have been part of the answer? Or um, what were the actual reference questions that are coming in where maybe the researchers aren't coming into the reading room themselves, but we're sending them a scan of something or taking them a photo of a specific map from an atlas to help them with their questions. Um, and then I went to our instruction librarian to talk about what classes have used maps. Have there been classes that have come in specifically to use maps? Or um, is it just us maybe inserting a map into a larger conversation? I also asked why and how a lot. I think these are two really great questions you should be asking throughout your career. Um, some of the ones I've been asking because the Clements has a local classification system, which is how does the local classification system work? Is there documentation on it? Why is there not documentation on it? Um, another one I've asked is why have we chosen to arrange some of our materials this way? Um, and fundamentally it came down to space. So a lot of our stuff is arranged um, by like size across divisions. So you'll have a range that has stuff from graphics, stuff from maps, stuff from manuscripts all stored together just so that we can make the best use of the space in our historic building. And then a key one for me was how do I get maps into our digital projects process, which is a partnership between the Clements, which is an independent library at University of Michigan and the larger library system on campus. And then another piece I found is that it's really great to follow up on a scrap of paper you find in your desk or hallway chatter or something in the break room at lunchtime. I'm finding that those sort of moments are things that fell through the cracks in kind of um, between the predecessor retiring and the gap in time to hire and me coming in. Um, so for example, I'm currently trying to track down a touring exhibit. Thankfully, no original items. They are posters um, that have been lent out quite a bit. And in the transition of the people in the curator positions, we don't know who currently has those posters. And yet we have somebody who would like to borrow them. So I'm calling up any lead I can find on a scrap of paper in a drawer. So when I'm starting to look through files related to it, this here gives you on the one side of the screen, we see tons of files, our digital files related to the graphics division, which is one of the divisions I'm over. Tons of files. Some of them are really, really nicely organized and some of them are simply titled less supplies, templates. Um, on the other hand though, what I get for the maps division is what you see where it says, where are these files? There is one file in the entire drive it's a PNG screenshot of the website in 2016. So that led me to 
asking around, where are the files? If they don't exist digitally, they have to exist physically. And in fact, they do. Um, I have file cabinets of files and I have boxes of files out at our remote storage facility. So this is how I was able to start going through and looking at historically what had been done in the map division. And then of course, my colleagues whose many faces you see in miniature there have been a really, really good source of knowledge. Um, I could find an accession file that says we have this thing that I can't find a catalog record for it or a finding aid or any other reference to it in our um, databases. I can go to them and be like, hey, it says we got this thing in like 1940. Do you know where it might be? And I might bounce around from employee to employee, but I'll eventually get somewhere. And then sure enough, we'll turn it up and it's like, oh, nobody has seen this. And it's so exciting. Um, so continuing to ask the questions and kind of poke and prod and maybe be a little bit of annoyance to my colleagues um, has really been great in getting me to these objects. And my second really big key point of this is it's okay to say no. And if no is not a word you're comfortable with, you could also say something like, I need more time or let me get back to you with that. I've been using a lot, huh, that's a great question. Let me investigate. So I'm finding that, you know, it's a real true reality that you have researchers who will come in and I'm getting this pretty common with some of the faculty who have memory of a map that was used in a class five years ago. And they might be able to like give me a general idea of what it is, but they can't give me a title, a creator, a date, if it was cataloged when they used it, anything like that. And so trying to hunt that down um, is quite complicated. And then sometimes somebody finds something in the catalog and I have a call number and I go to where that call number will be in a drawer and I go to the drawer and it's not there. So sometimes it's a really practical no of just, I'm really sorry, I can't find this object at the moment. I'll continue to look and get back with you. But sometimes the no is going to be around um, commitments or sort of the way your predecessor operated. I've come into a position that merged the curator over two divisions where previously there were two curators. So there's a lot of legacy in how instruction was provided or workshops or maybe friendly privileges that were offered at the library that I don't have any recollection of because I wasn't here for it. Um, so I've discussed this of course with my director and, and it's looking at and analyzing these past commitments and, and deciding which ones aren't ones we really need to hold up to and having the conversation then with that individual or the organization that it was with. Um, it can be really easy to fall into the trap of being the new name of your predecessor. So I've really tried to encourage my colleagues not to introduce me as the new Clayton or the new Brian, um, because my role has fundamentally changed and um, what it looks like within the organization. So I'm not that new person. It's a new role. Um, and so I'm hoping that helps manage and set some new expectations and how I'll interact with the faculty, the researchers, and the students. And the same sort of thing, too, is I will get a lot of when I'm doing teaching, you have big shoes to fill. And I'll say, yes, yes, Clayton was fabulous and did really great stuff with the photography collection. Um, I'm coming in with a different skill set, and I'm really excited to explore and learn and continue to collaborate with you. Um, however, there might be a little bit of difference in what that looks like. Um, and then to wrap up, all that to say, it's about having a plan. Um, these are all because what is a presentation to a map group without something mappy in it? Um, title cartouches from a number of maps in the collection. Um, you need a plan. You're going to come in. I came in with a spreadsheet. I love a spreadsheet with my ideas how I was going to approach my first month in the collection. And some of that went right out the window on day one. Some of it's really held true. And it's about working with it, being flexible, asking the questions, not being afraid to say, I don't know what to do, and getting help from the colleagues or other people in the field who've um, moved into um, or have worked long in a really highly specialized collection of maps. Um, I've been telling my, my staff that work under me I'm having a good time because I've found there's not been a lot of documentation on the collections that my legacy at the Clements will be producing really great documentation for future people working in the collection. Thank you, Sierra. Uh, uh, another great presentation to round out this uh, our first session here. Um, I will open the floor to uh, any questions or discussions. I see that um, our first group of panelists have been refer have been replying to some of the questions directly in the chat. Um, Kevin, are there any other uh, chat questions that we'd want to uh, 
I'm not seeing any. There's been just some nice discussion going on. Um, uh, Susan, uh, Susan Moore was asking uh, the first group, or she said, we're, yeah, we are limited by state law, how we can uh, dispose of library materials. Anyone else have this issue? And I think that's a really good question. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, Janet, Martin, any uh, thoughts on that? Or anyone else, really? I'll let that go to Janet and also talk about the, the federal depository, some aspects of that. Well, Chris, <laughs> I don't have anything to say, really. Um, we did not have that obstacle um, for for what I did. Um, but yeah, it kind of reminded me, like you said, about the depository. So, um, oh, I see Sierra has her hand raised. <laughs> so when I was at Texas A&M, there was very strong policy around what we could and could not do with library collections that had been um, accessioned and added to the collections because they were state property. My opportunity was to transfer it to another state entity or dispose of it through our pulping program. So there was a fair amount of transfer between the state organizations trying to, to figure that out. But I sat down and, and read what that policy said and it said accessioned. Uh, and so I kind of took a little bit of a wild west approach and it was just like anything in the drawer that doesn't have a catalog number, doesn't have a property stamp, doesn't have a record that it's here, was never accessioned. And it sort of fly by night secretly got dispersed to other collections. Um, so part of it was finding that little loophole um, of where maybe they're not actually critically watching. Um, and I mean, you know, I talked with some of our, our um, collection managers and other parts of the facilities. And um, it was much easier or cheaper for us to actually pay the shipping and handling to send a tube of 10 maps to another institution than it was to pulp those 10 maps through our pulping contract. Um, so everybody just kind of turned a blind eye. We felt we were okay because there was no record that the state owned these objects. So they had never quote been accessioned. Yeah, I think technically with the FDLP that if you're getting rid of things that you have to notify the regional libraries and ask if they would like them. Um, I, in the past, uh, have been fortunate when I am dumping a, a lot of things, when I got rid of my nautical charts, for example, that they didn't ask for a list. They're just the general pass. And so that was that was convenient. And I think most um, there might be some regionals here on the on the call that can speak to that a little more. But um, yeah, thank you. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments that we want to send to our presenters before we take a short break? I'll just jump in real quick here. Uh, we did this uh, workshop, a similar workshop at WAMO, and we asked them, uh, kind of had a quick poll, we only had 11 people, but we asked about what can what can you get rid of? Uh, what can you never get rid of? And the two things that everybody agreed on was local stuff and big gifts from big donors. And that um, the appropriate things to get rid of were international topos, uh, tourist maps and subjects that didn't fit your institution. And the one thing that we all thought was very funny that, you know, what can, we asked, what can you get rid of? That there will be limited consequences if you get rid of it. <laughs> one of the big things that came right to the top was Europe. <laughs> and uh, it was fun. I think we had 30 people in the room and we all shook our heads and said, Europe, I think they can get rid of, so. Great. Thank you, everybody. We will reconvene for session two at two o'clock Eastern and 11 o'clock Pacific. Uh, thanks again to all of our presenters, um, and we'll see you shortly.
I'll be our moderator for the uh, second session of today. We have a presentation as well as a handful of lightning talks. Just a reminder, we are going to hold questions for the end after all of the presentations, just to make sure everyone has time to speak first and foremost. And I am happy to introduce for our presentation in this session, Wade Bishop of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville and Christina Larson of Stanford University. So feel free to take it away. Well, thank you, Megan, and everyone else for attending. Again, it's a, a fantastic event. Very, very excited to see folks I haven't seen in, in years and happy to have an outlet to share what we found recently studying uh, you all, basically. Uh, my name is Wade Bishop, a professor and now director of graduate studies here at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I'm also the coordinator for the research data management certificate here. Uh, just a quick plug, if you're trying to upskill with the response to all the new data services librarian jobs and requirements from funding agencies to have data management plans, it's a great way to, you know, learn, learn those skills. Uh, for just 12 credits. I'm also a research security ambassador for the university, uh, helping protect our research and development um, that uh, that's federally funded that we shouldn't hold on to and not have stolen. And I'm really the most lucky advisor in the world because I have Christina Larson, a recent graduate of our program, uh, working for a couple of years and really volunteered to make this happen as the assistant rare map librarian. Uh, she's going to go ahead and talk through a lot of the findings, um, but was instrumental in designing this survey and helping pilot test it, all kinds of other things there at the David Rumsey Map Center and at Stanford. So um, we're, we're very, very lucky. Uh, I kind of wanted to focus on what is a librarian. It's a theme that's already come up and it's kind of continuous throughout the literature in this area. Um, there has been, uh, I guess, 100 years, so it was a good time for us to update uh, in response to the Williamson reports, if anybody is interested in library history and education, it's it's great. Um, he was really pushing back a Carnegie funded project to study the state of education at that time and recommended having some standards. You know, they were we're all teaching different things. Why don't we have some more standardization of what's being taught? It took a while for ALA to have accreditation standards that were pretty firm and having that accrediting body. Uh, so at, at that point, um, a librarian was, it was decided that a master's degree would be the terminal degree and adequately prepare people to work in places like libraries. Um, certainly, uh, I was very fortunate to do some work in geographic information librarianship uh, had an IMLS grant to study you all. That was a, over a decade ago. So this study is a decade update from that original survey validation. Uh, for a lot of you in this Zoom room were there to help craft the core competences we have. Uh, and the idea to was to develop curriculum that would basically map to what you actually need to know, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that people on the job actually need to do all these wonderful things instead of whatever a professor finds interesting or you know the newest trend in technology. Um, so it was very fortunate that McGirt had four competencies to validate, and we did them uh, again a decade ago. And when there was updated core competencies in 2018, we went ahead and just redid it. So this is today's, you know, hot off the presses findings from the survey data collection that happened last fall. I'll mention that at UT's program, we still have geographic information and information sciences and uh, 516 geospatial technologies. So if you have any staff that are interested in pursuing a master's degree, an ALA accredited degree, a top 10 program degree, uh, this is definitely one that we're, we're still very strong and have a, a pathway for this area. Uh, being ALA accredited and also, also an iSchool affiliated member. Uh, in 2013, we were looking at the 2008 McGirt core competencies. Um, again, thanks to those authors who spent time, a lot of time, uh, writing them all out. And we used them to inform the learning outcomes. But after a decade, I realized it's time to do an update. Uh, so luckily, we had uh, Christina being interested in this. And we looked to validate the 2018 McGirt core competencies to you know, re-inform our stuff. The survey was sent out through MAPSEL, so I'm sure a lot of you responded. Thank you so much. There's no data to report without participants. 
Um, these are some globes at the University of Michigan, actually. I was there last week at an open science symposium. I was like, oh, I need more content for my slides. So good to hear some some stuff from, from Ann Arbor today, too. Um, let's just cross paths. Uh, this distribution potentially reached a thousand people, so it's not quite representative. I can't report those kind of statistics, but since we reached out to GIS for Lib and Mapsell, I think we got all the relevant people. Uh, there are only a handful that actually subscribe to both, um, so or to only one, I should say. Uh, we only had 70 complete responses, so that was very handy. And thank you again. It was 21 questions, but we were evaluating a lot of core competencies. So I know it probably took 20 to 30 minutes. So I appreciate everybody who participated. And I'll turn it over to Christina for the exciting fun part, uh, what we found. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to, will you stop sharing so I can drive over here? Okay, I got the right one. Awesome. Okay, so um, there's a lot to cover, and I'll so I'll, I'll be moving kind of quickly at points, but um, also we can take questions at the end, and of course we'll be happy to share all of this with anybody who's interested. Um, so uh, starting with the uh, participant background information, we asked all the participants to respond to seven questions about their professional backgrounds and positions within their respective institutions. Um, First, we asked participants to report the number of years of experience they had working as information professionals and years worked with cartographic resources. Respondents had a variety of years of experience, but uh, a majority for both were working with um, working for 11 years or more. Uh, the information professional uh, years are on the left and the cartographic resource uh, experience years are on the right. Asked to describe their educational background of the 70 participants, nine listed doctoral degrees as their highest degree and the majority 58 um, held a master's degree. An open-ended text entry for degrees was included. So 38 of those with master's degrees indicated some type of library and information science credential. 15 listed geography related master's degrees and 12 had graduate degrees in some combination. Uh, participants were also asked to name other relevant professional certifications, education, or training. Uh, the certifications reported covered GIS, library or archival sciences, project management certificates, and data analytics. And in addition to these certifications, people wrote in a wide variety of other relevant coursework, which covered everything from GIS classes, cataloging workshops, data science workshops, and of course, learning on the job. Asked where their position was located in the institution, the vast majority reported working within libraries, uh, that's 65 or 92.9%, with only five reporting working outside of the library. We then asked where in the institution the GIS support services were located. So 19 said in the library, uh, the majority again indicated that there are GIS and geospatial data support services, both within the library and other parts of the institution. Nine indicated that support services were only provided by a separate department, and seven didn't know how to respond to the question. Uh, in response to the question, are you a librarian? The majority of participants, 90% indicated yes. Uh, seven participants or 10% selected no. And an open-ended job title question followed. So as supported by our literature review, there is little standardization of job titles across the field. So of the 67 responses where a title is indicated, we had 59 unique entries. So we counted occurrences of text and found 35 uh, of the titles or 52% included the term librarian, 20 included the word map, and 11 contained map and librarian, GIS, or data. Uh, in response to the question, what kind of cartographic resources do you handle? Uh, the majority uh, indicated digital surrogates of paper maps uh, with circulating contemporary maps and other cartographic typical paper material uh, and spatial data and GIS databases, both 46 people reporting working with those, followed by born digital maps and uh, about half reporting working with antiquarian or non-circulating maps in a special collection setting. So now we'll take a look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, importance ratings. So just a note about the survey design. The McGirt list of core competencies is long and pretty complex, so it wasn't possible to ask everyone to rank every single element in the list. 
uh, we distilled it down into the more generalized groupings shown here on this slide. Um, in keeping with the introduction to the competencies publication, we omitted things like project management and good communication, which are absolutely essential skills, but not necessarily specific to librarianship. And then at the end, we cross-checked these original, the original competencies with the new categories to make sure that we hadn't lost anything critical from the original document. Um, after completing the background information section, the respondents indicated which of these seven groups uh, were part of their jobs and then were asked subsequently to rank the respective KSAs contained within those groups using the important scale that's here to the right. So this slide shows us the important scores for the general cartographic and geospatial competencies group. Um, the KSAs are here in the list to the left and their mean importance scores are indicated by the bar to the right. The color scale that is used here is a two color distributed scale with dark green at the high end and dark red at the bottom end. The center value is set to three. So while across the next few slides, the high and low values are going to be different, the coloring is consistent across the charts. And at the end, we'll look at all of them in one giant list. Um, it's worth noting that the very lowest ranked of the 44 tasks scored a 2.17. So this is an activity that 24 respondents indicated that they performed, and that's 34% or roughly one in three people who took the survey. Um, so even the lowest ranked things are uh, still considered to be somewhat important. Um, this particular group, the General Cartographic and Geospatial Competencies, was required of all the survey participants um, because the uh, authors of the um, the core competencies had indicated that this was core to the knowledge base for all map and geospatial librarians. And so looking at the results here sorted by the mean at the top, we have geographic and cartographic principles or basic knowledge about maps, followed by ways of finding authoritative information about cartographic resources. Uh, as I go through these slides, again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna touch on the top ranked uh, things in most cases. So the sections that follow are in alphabetical order by the name of the responsibility group. Um, for access and use of technology, the top ranked KSAs were use of GIS programs, both cloud and desktop based, and use of web mapping and geospatial web services and their data sources. Um, KSAs related to the use of GPS technology were ranked lowest. For cataloging and metadata creation, all of the KSAs scored above three. So it's maybe unsurprising that the metadata folks who wrote these core competencies characterized their job duties with really high levels of accuracy and specificity. Uh, another factor may be the fact that these jobs have a more narrow focus than some others in academic map libraries, and also maybe more consistent sets of responsibilities across institutions. Um, so the top two KSAs for cataloging and metadata creation were metadata creation and cataloging. And the collection development and management group of responsibilities, the top items here are assessment and analysis of collections um, and the ability to organize cartographic resources with policy development and compliance and weeding scoring lowest in this group as these are responsibilities handled by fewer people, generally speaking. For outreach and engagement, the top ranked KSAs were promoting awareness of geospatial uh, resources, events, services, and other offerings participation in conferences and the ability to produce library programs and digital exhibitions, physical, physical exhibitions and managing social media were scored uh, at the low end. For reference and instruction services, the ability to um, uh, conduct reference interviews were at the top. Again, this is a section where all of the KSAs were ranked over three. Um, so reference interviews and knowledge of discovery tools followed by creation of instructional material and providing one-on-one -on -one inst instruction were at the top of this list. And then the final category, research support. Um, we have just one KSA that scored over three and that's the ability to perform research consultations. So this is the entire list and it's difficult to read the individual rows in this view, but you can see the overall there's a lot of green. The individual scores were all fairly high and indicating that um, the respondents engaged in these areas of responsibility consider all of them to be at least somewhat important. Okay, so now we're gonna look at this in a slightly different way. Um, and here we've sorted the importance list, uh, the, the entire list by the importance score so that we can look at trends across the groups. 
And on this slide, we're looking at the top 15 competencies. The uh, KSAs, again, are in this list to the left, followed by the mean bars, which in this view have been color-coded to indicate which responsibility group they belong to. And the legend for that is here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, there are a couple of additional data points in this chart in the center column in warm gray labeled DNP. This is the number of respondents who selected do not perform for each of the tasks. And the column at the far right with cool grays shows the total number of respondents who assigned an importance level to the task. So just as an example, looking at the first one, uh, the, the top one here is ability to perform research consultations. It's purple because it's part of the research support group. Uh, zero people indicated that they do not perform it, and 54 people ranked the task, uh, gave it an important score. Um, just one other thing to note on this slide, uh, you'll note that the blue bars in here, the general cartographic and geospatial competencies, um, they have uh, DMP counts of zero and an N of 68, so uh, everyone answered these and everyone uses them. So we're going to stay with this list. I'm going to take out the DMP and N columns, and we're going to take a, a closer look at what we see can see here. Uh, so most of the responsibilities in the top 15 are what we're calling service-oriented KSAs. So at the very top is uh, research support uh, in purple, followed by promotion of resources and offerings. Um, for outreach and engagement in green. And third is the ability to conduct reference interviews shown in yellow from the reference and instruction services grouping. And then you'll notice that the green and yellow items are kind of interleaved with one another down the list. And, um, and they represent most of the KSAs from these groups. So looking at the rest of the list, uh, we see what we're calling domain knowledge KSAs. So we would expect to see high scores for the general cartographic competencies, those blue ones. Uh, since that section was required of all respondents. And here we have the, those top two, understanding essential qualities of maps and knowing how to find authoritative information. And then the other thing to notice here uh, is the cluster of red, which contains the top four cataloging and metadata creation KSAs. So what we see is that nine out of the top 11 competencies, I didn't do 10 because uh, 10 and 11 have the same score. So nine out of the top 11, are service-oriented KSAs of the kind typically included in an MLIS degree program. And then these are closely followed by or associated with specialized domain knowledge. All right, and then just a moment looking at the lowest scoring 15. At the bottom of the list is the task I mentioned at the beginning. This is managing social media accounts and the outreach group. 27 people selected do not perform and the 24 who ranked it gave it a mean score of 2.17. Um, also in this list, we see the rest of the research support group. So they were, there was the top one and then all the rest are in the bottom 15. Um, and the rest of the, geo, the general cartographic and geospatial competencies, these blue ones, Four tasks from access and use of technology, that's the orange uh, section here, and then collection development and management, which is this aqua color mostly scored in the middle of the pack, so they didn't turn up on either the top or bottom lists. And uh, just another note about the do not perform, these are the top things that people said they didn't do, managing social media accounts, managing GIS software, hardware and licensing, teaching credit hour courses, supporting grant work, transforming geospatial data formats, knowledge of and maintaining GPS technologies and managing websites. So a little bit of summary in the moments that we have left. Um, so the, the competencies are in fact core. Um, the importance ratings provide validation to support the inclusion of many of the CCs into curricula. So um, limitations posed by course structures and student capacity, of course, require instructors to focus the syllabuses on only the most foundational and important KSAs but these survey results can potentially inform which topics get prioritized for inclusion in those programs. So an MLIS uh, degree is a great foundation since nine out of the top 11 KSAs are typically covered uh, by uh, MLIS or MSIS programs. Um, it can be assumed that specific geospatial examples or use cases are rare in a lot of those programs, but nonetheless, it appears that an LIS education can provide a good foundation for these roles. Um, so libraries uh, should continue to prioritize this degree in hiring for the positions. Um, the field should also, of course, continue efforts to support early career map librarians in building KSAs in those domain-specific areas uh, that they're less likely to encounter in their 
uh, master's programs. And again, just to sort of emphasize that, the importance of the role of professional organizations um, in lieu of integrated education for MAP librarians in those MLIS programs, organizations like this one, like McGirt, Whammel, Roll G, Glow, and others can continue to provide access to professional development opportunities. And these core competencies, whether taken as a whole in the original list or in the summarized form used in the survey, could serve as a good framework for a structured, centrally managed index of resources. And again, hopefully these survey validation results can be used to inform efforts focused on addressing the most critical needs. And with that, we're at the end. Let's give a big round of applause for applause for Wade and Christina. That was excellent. Uh, I am now happy to introduce the start of our five lightning talks for this round of presentations today. And first, I'm going to introduce Tara Anthony of Penn State University Libraries, presenting on balancing information discovery and user needs in geospatial consultations. So Tara, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking today a lot about geospatial consultation, so it was great to just follow up on that presentation as well. A little bit about my background. Um, I've been at Penn State University Libraries from uh, 2013. I have previous experience in the geospatial industry, and um, I have um, graduate master's degrees in geography, adult education, and information and library science. So a little background about Penn State University Libraries and our Donald W. Hammer Center for Maps and Geospatial Information. We have both a physical maps collection, but also um, GIS services as well. And so we serve students across disciplines. And um, the mode of contact includes both in-person, Zoom, and chat, along with phone. So I'm going to highlight a few of those in um, today's lightning talks from user stories from the fall of 2023. And just to recap, many of the things when talking about reference and consultation um, are kind of thought about in this process. So it's like items around inclusion, being approachable, being engaging, along with different search strategies, and really kind of helping those users evaluate different resources. A little bit about how folks can either schedule a consultation or walk in for a, a consultation with us. So we've used multiple types of booking systems over the years. They've been BookMe, um, LipCal, and now we're using Microsoft Bookings. And currently, the Maps and GIS bookings um, are part of a broader suite of services in research informatics and publishing. So I just thought I'd mention that since every institution might have a different way in which maybe folks um, in their library can schedule a consultation or walk in for for different types of services. And so I just thought I'd mention those in terms of like, we ask a few questions to our users um, in terms of what types of projects that they might be interested in talking to us about when they do um, come in for a scheduled consultation. And a little bit about what our in-person consultations look like. Um, so I meet with folks regularly in my office. Um, I'll turn my screen around. Um, they often do bring their own laptops um, with GIS software installed on them. Um, that, but if they don't have GIS software installed and they're asking and wanting to work with us, um, we do have two um, computers dedicated for that type of walk-in and consultation type of work. And so you kind of can see what our setup looks like in these pictures. I figured I'd provide these just to um, so folks can think about what their physical space looks like for that type of work. And um, recently, in this last fall, uh, someone asked me a little bit more about what a geospatial consultation looked like. As someone new to the maps and geospatial field, um, they were asking a little bit, like, what really does that look like and what goes into that? And I was like, well, you know, I've kind of had to talk to my library colleagues over the years and um, think about what questions I really ask during a geospatial consultation to really get at what would be helpful for the user. You know, a lot of those type of open-ended questions um, in terms of, like, what type of data that they're looking for, what they're their experience has been, what type of learning resources they might be um, looking for, and then really kind of what their end goals are. And so this was just something I put together many years ago. And in light of this, this presentation, I thought I'd kind of revisit some aspects of it. Um, and also times often I'll have a little bit of information before someone comes in for a scheduled consultation. So I'm often thinking about kind of what type of preparation I have beforehand, what types of things I might want to look up around the specific context of the user. And I do have a guide as well, thinking about what some of those kind of questions about a map project or a geospatial project um, that you might want to be thinking about when working with types of users. 
So I just thought I'd highlight that as well. And then I pulled out a few of our user stories to highlight as well. So with our interest in consultations, for example, um, thinking about some aspects of, um, I have two that I'm highlighting here, one with an engineering graduate student. So this was much more of a hands-on consultation and involved um, working with different census tracts across multiple counties, working in pro, working a lot with um, kind of like kind of guiding them through what it's like to um, work with these types of layers as this graduate student was new to um, working with GIS data, but also an undergraduate student who was really looking for, in this case, Africa Juice spatial data, um, working with them, uh, kind of showing them the different search strategies for ArcGIS Online, um, what different layers in ArcGIS Online meant, and how that could relate to a story map that they're doing. So that was also much more a hands-on approach, um, demoing different things in the ArcGIS Online environment. So keeping in mind things around their time frame, uh, what their experience level, what their different technology has, and what type of resources, and then what type of things would be appro appropriate for them, whether it's that hands-on approach with demonstrations, and then watching them go through the process and then kind of seeing what their different comfort level is. So those are just some of the key areas of a consultation that I'm looking at. And then these are some examples. You know, I may be looking at state um, repositories for geospatial data. I may be looking at the BTA geoportal for resources. I might be searching in ArcGIS online. And then I'm also thinking about our libraries collection, whether it's things in our catalog or other subscribed um, databases and also different types of software applications to be um, familiar with. You know, we've got the various different Esri products, um, ArcGIS Online, the multiple suites of um, online um, applications, story maps, um, Survey123, dashboards, but then also QGIS and other types of functionality too. I just kind of thought I'd mention a little bit of the types of software um, to be familiar with and also with G GPS units too. We do have those as well that can come up consultation. Um, in terms of online consultation, um, this is a little bit some examples of a graduate student and an undergraduate student. So a graduate student um, asking about, let's say, nutrition data and mapping around food access. Um, this is also kind of a newer student looking around, thinking about how to apply geospatial information to their project. Um, I gave some demonstration of some of our um, Simply Analytics also that has some health um, data in it that they might be interested in. And then on another undergraduate talking about um, story maps, again, kind of walking them through in the online environment because um, many of our students too, it's whether they're they're through World Campus also that they integrate using story maps. So um, being familiar with how best to help them too. And in terms of the kind of differences between the in-person and online with the email, a little bit more of informational approach with some of the questions I've received. Some of them might be around some things around like licensing or things that I would be referring them to our licensing department at Penn State or just other kind of information about processes and services that might be more applicable to um, pointing them to some li library guides or other types of sources as well. And then phone also. So people do sometimes call, for instance, that online um, students might call first to have a question and then that might turn into a Zoom consultation or it may be a Pennsylvania um, resident or visitor asking about things around our, geos our map collection too. Um, so I gave an example of that also. So someone looking for Sanborn fire insurance and maps and then talking to them again, kind of through a dialogue approach to really get at what they're looking at. Um, so I just thought I'd mention a little bit, many of our library guides are things that <clears throat> we put together over the years that could have been helpful either through our consultations, our instruction, and really can cover a broad range of topics. So whether it's the particular software, uh, remote sensing, or other types of map resources as well. And sometimes I'll pick different parts of these when I am working with someone to highlight, to um, refer them back to. So just thinking also about the different balance of information discovery and our user needs, it really can be a combination of thinking about resources such as guides, software, software demonstration and instruction, and additional documentation and other resources, and really balancing what that user needs in terms of strategy, multiple types of approaches and workflows, and other kind of foundational knowledge that really could um, impact how much time they have and what type of things they really want to be getting out of the consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Everyone, big round of applause. And we're going to move into our next lightning talk by Samuel Kim of the University of Buffalo on learning management systems and the flipped classroom, tools for the geospatial librarian. Sam, feel free to take it away. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sam Kim, and I am 
a new GIS and geospatial librarian. I just started recently in September. Uh, but um, just a bit more on my background. Oh, awesome. Um, I'm an early career librarian, and most of my work has been in information literacy instruction, and it's reflected in uh, this, this lightning talk. Uh, it's building on some work that I've done in, at a previous institution before I became a geospatial librarian, uh, where I used Flip Classroom and a learning management system to introduce nursing students, graduate nursing students, uh, to mapping concepts in relation to uh, public health issues and epidemiology. And so I'm just building on that. Um, building on that going forward. Uh, so why use the flipped classroom and the learning management system? Uh, my aim was to reduce information overload. I was really given one three hour session, but I'd cover everything from basic information literacy instruction, like navigating our resources all the way to um, locating the appropriate data sets to use to generate their maps. And this was without social explorer and policy maps. So it's all through government uh, um, data sets and search engines, which uh, was a bit of a, was a bit taxing to the students. Um, additionally, this as a, it blends with the previous objective. It made the one shot more efficient by going with this approach. So I had three hours that I could devote entirely to a hands-on activity, whereas leading up to the session, the students would be focused more on uh, learning anything foundational. And finally, this just applies going forward is to make uh, information literacy more accessible, which is what I plan on doing currently at UB. Uh, so some background on uh, the flip classroom. Uh, it's, if you're not a if you're not familiar, it's a model of teaching uh, where we take the passive learning component that we're used to, we may be used to, which is the lecture, take it outside of the classroom. So usually it's uh, usually a pre-recorded video or a slide deck that students would view leading up to the session. And now the class time, the 60 minute, 90 minute one shot, then become, then it gets freed up. Uh, so in my case, I devoted that time to activities, discussions or hands-on practice that is relevant to their assignments, so the, it's contextualized. Um, Accessibility-wise, it's really great because it allows students to learn at their own pace, uh, especially in the case of graduate students. Uh, that's usually when you see the highest incidence of non-traditional learners. They aren't coming straight from undergrad. Some of them may have been in the field for a while, and they have various uh, levels of competencies, uh, whether it be for technology or just uh, for research. And for learning management systems, if you are not fami uh, familiar, it's a content management system. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, D2L's Brightspace, Moodle, Canvas, uh, Blackboard. It's where students and course faculty will convene in a virtual space. All of their materials will be there. Um, it's really a great resource for any librarian to just have access to that. And if I wanted to implement it for GIS or geospatial instruction, uh, something I had planned uh, going forward, actually currently, is moving a lot of passive learning components like a basic catalog searching intro to geographic information systems. Uh, the setup process for any software at the University of Buffalo, we have uh, access to ArcGIS through a work order form that takes around 48 hours to get fully processed. So having that information on the learning management system well in advance really streamlines the actual and hands-on instruction of using ArcGIS online or story maps. And if there are any loopholes for access or any hiccups for accessing relevant software, like if it has to be through a VPN for any remote learners, that's where I would put that information in. And then the freed up hands-on activities could be anything from just finding a map of Erie County in this case, uh, ideally electronically. Uh, I will try to bring in hands, uh, physical maps just because it's a novelty to most students, especially outside of uh, the traditional disciplines that 
interact with geography, uh, like for nursing, uh, importing a new layer or base map, uh, which is currently what I'm working on with a history faculty, or locating a relevant shape file uh, to use if you want to identify uh, epidemiologic issues specific to uh, diabetes or obesity. And getting to that part, uh, which anyone can do, it's first and most important step is actually getting set up with an account. Um, I've learned here at UB, not everybody gets set up with an account from the get-go, uh, just because you have faculty status. They have to set you up. Um, so really reach out to your academic technology department or university IT. So that's usually the first step. And once you're set up with a sandbox, that's when you can really have fun with just creating your materials. Now, I'm gonna actually have to switch screen and hopefully this is seamless. Um, so this is actually what I have on screen. Uh, this is just an example of what I have created in uh, Sandbox. Uh, so this is just a module, the landing page with D2L's Brightspace. And I have uh, just one example for Leap into McGirt. And I have various modules added in. A lot of these are just linking out to existing web pages so that I don't have to create everything from scratch. It's just a link. Students can get to that link. Um, it's great for all of our metrics because so you can see all of that traffic and it's being sourced out from here. And also, if it really nips the common frequently asked questions issue in the bud, like how do I request any new materials? And I can plug and play any of these modules. So I can drag and drop them into new modules that I designed for specific classes that may have different learning needs. And this is just one such example where it's just intro to GIS. Back. Um, so, so some tips for doing uh, implementing a flipped classroom with a learning management system. Um, offer your services as an embedded librarian, which is what I've done. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can reuse existing material, just pop them into your learning management system. And especially for junior faculty or new librarians, if you want to build report, attend those uh, faculty orientation workshops where they teach you the learning management system. It's a great way of building a relationship with other junior faculty and establish new uh, relationships. Uh, these are just some of my future goals, but I'm gonna have to skip through that. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentation. And we're going to move to our next lightning talk by Julia Guy and Rena Trung of the University of Calgary, both of them, on using Esri web maps for digital map discovery. Feel free to take it away. There we go. You can hear me okay? All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our session. Today, we will be talking about how we are using Esri web apps to allow users to browse and discover our digitized map collection. So we'll start with some introductions. Uh, I'm Julia Guy. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the digital projects librarian GIS at the University of Calgary. And I'm Raina Trung, uh, pronouns also she, her, and I'm the Data and Geospatial Resource Specialist. So we are part of Spatial and Numeric Data Services, which is a unit at Libraries and Cultural Resources at UCalgary. Uh, we're located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, so Martin's not the only Canadian. Um, this place is also known as Mokinsis. It's on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 uh, and the, is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6. So for backgrounds at UCalgary, we have a substantial map and air photo collection, and we also provide access to geospatial data for our users. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about our solution to a problem. Uh, and that problem is that we have a fantastic digital asset management system here. This is what we use for our digital collections. 
It is great for metadata and preservation and search engine visibility. Uh, it's also highly customizable, which is great. Uh, but that said, our digital collections is not always the most intuitive for searching and browsing from a user perspective. And in particular with maps, we think that text searches uh, using a search bar may not always work for every scenario of a user looking for a map. Uh, and we want people to be able to find maps using a map. So this is our solution here. So this is our Spatial and Numeric Data Services website. Uh, along the top, there is a little tab uh, leading to our applications, which Rena created. Uh, and a lot of these applications link directly to a map collection that is digitized. Uh, so for example, if you click on one of the web apps, we'll click on uh, our Alberta Township maps. Uh, this will take you to the app. And here you can search by navigating on the map uh, or by entering a location. And you can see the extents of the different maps we have digitized in this collection. So clicking on that area will provide some links to our digital asset management system. In this case, selecting the year opened up this item. Uh, here, users can see all the metadata. They can zoom in, um, kind of explore. They can also download the map from here uh, if it's um, in the public domain. Uh, and they can also get a link. So as you can see, this approach sort of uses two different systems. So we have our digital collections, which is our digital asset management system. And that's where all the items are stored once they've been digitized. The back end is Cortex by Orange Logic. Uh, this is a proprietary software that our library is invested in. Uh, and we use it for all kinds of digital assets. It's got digitized archival materials. It's got audiovisual materials. Um, digitized books, just a ton of stuff in it. Um, and the system is actually directly connected to LibSafe, our digital preservation system, which is a great advantage. Uh, and there are other benefits as well. And Rena is going to talk about our Esri web app system. Uh, thanks, Julia. Our educational license with Esri allows us to leverage many of our uh, of their products, such as Web App Builder. All 13 of our deployed apps are built using templates from developer edition of Web App Builder with some minor uh, customization. These apps were developed to aid the discovery of some of our materials from going from our web map or going from our maps to air photos to spatial data collection. Um, going into a few examples, um, here on the left side uh, is a comparison of our dam and then to our Esri web app on the right. On the left, um, you can see that it's a single map with metadata attached, viewing, downloading capabilities. On the right, the extent of each map in the Alberta Township Plan Collection is visible on the map. Users can use this map-centric tool to quickly obtain the resource thereafter by navigating to the place of interest or clicking on the feature. And then once clicking on the feature, uh, brings up a pop-up window with many years, um, well, if available. And you can see in this example, there are three maps um, for that particular township. Um, so going into another example, uh, this one is our Esri web app for our digitized air photo collection displaying air photo centers. This app is slightly different than the township plans. It includes a filtering option, which is the panel on the right, where users can narrow down what they're looking for by date and scale. In addition, the pop-up window for each feature contains an image preview. Um, so if you click on that preview, it forwards us to our dam. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is the whole air photo set and associating flight line index is also available in our dam. Um, on the left side, you can click the call number and then it brings you to the window on the right there. Okay, so moving into some of the pros and cons of using Esri web apps and Cortex for a map discovery. Let's start with the pros. Having a map-centric tool does allow users to locate cartographic materials more quickly compared to using a text-based search. Um, in addition, using templates um, to build these apps uh, makes for a faster turnaround time moving from development to deploying it. Um, as mentioned earlier, our dam is highly customizable, flexible, and produces and provides great search engine visibility. So having both of these uh, systems in place provides two access points, meaning that uh, our materials would be used more often. So going into the cons, maintaining two different systems can be challenging. For instance, Web App Builder is slated for retirement this summer. 
So we are migrating to our GIS experience builder, but finding the time to do this in-house as a team of two is really tough. Um, our dam is maintained by the IT group. So working together is very important. Our apps are indexed, so they do come up when you use a search engine. However, you have to know the right keywords. Um, in addition, the apps that we have created are on our main web page, but users will have to know that they are there first um, for them to actually get to it. Um, one additional con is that users can go from our apps to our dam, but not from our dam back to our apps. So thinking about our next steps, we're currently wrapping up two map digitization projects that will be published in both systems. We're also going to do some user testing this April just to kind of see how this works from uh, someone's point of view who's not really familiar. Um, as Rena said, we're updating to Esri Experience Builder, always adding more to our online collection. Um, we're also going to explore using the Cortex or Digital Asset Management System for geospatial data as well to see if that would work. So thank you so much. Um, feel free to reach out to either of us if you ever want to follow up. Uh, and thanks for your attention. Thank you both so much. Super great information in your presentation today. And we're going to move on to our next lightning talk. I'm happy to introduce two of my excellent University of California colleagues, Amy Work and Michael Smith, both of University of California at San Diego on an agile approach to managing a data and GIS lab. Thank you for having us. Okay. Uh, so welcome to an agile approach to managing a data and GIS lab. I'm Amy Work, the GIS librarian here at UC San Diego. And I'm Mike Smith. I'm the map librarian, and I'm also a subject and reference librarian. We co-manage the data and GIS lab with two other colleagues. Uh, we are located in Geisel Library. And the lab has been a patron serving space since the 1990s with different service models. We are currently staffed with student assistants. There are five physical machines and two monitor stations and 25 virtual machines. The lab is a space for dropping questions, consultations with librarians, and where student assistants work on assigned projects. We typically have about four to six student employees every quarter and the lab is staffed uh, 10, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday in non-overlapping shifts. And each student works about six to 10 hours a week. There are also four support librarians who are on call for questions. Uh, UC San Diego is uh, part of the UC system. We currently have about 43,000 students and, and uh, it's growing very rapidly. <laughs> um, the campus does not have a geography department. However, we cater to many different departments. Uh, and the most important to us are the Urban Studies and Planning Department, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and the School of Global Policy and Strategy, which is a graduate school. Um, the, the lab is the only space on campus for GIS and data general support, even though there are other labs around campus, uh, those are closed uh, to those departments. And so really we're taking a look at why Agile to help you manage our data and GIS lab. And it's really developed out of a response to as librarians stopping in to see what students were working on and our students, specifically our student employees and our student employees having more in-depth questions that we weren't necessarily prepared to answer in the two minutes we had between meetings or between consultations. And so we felt like we weren't giving justice to our student employees to help them with their projects as well as help manage the questions that they were receiving from patrons. So what is Agile? Agile is a series of um, values and guiding principles. It's a response to the software development community to what was known as waterfall development, where you're building something, planning, designing up front, building it, and then developing it, and then deploying it at the very end. So it's really a 
mindset or philosophy of values that value adaptability and responsiveness to change throughout the entire process. It prioritizes delivering working software in shorter timeframes, gathering feedback and making continuous improvement throughout everything. So Scrum is a specific type of agile framework. And what Scrum is built around is it breaks work into smaller manageable chunks known as sprints uh, or work cycles. They have specific roles where there's a product owner and a development team. They have different events, so sprint planning, daily standups, uh, sprint reviews, and sprint retrospectives. They have artifacts then, so backlogs of what is to happen in the sprint and, and the product as well that help guide the overall development process. And so, right, thinking about software development and how do we apply this to our data and GIS lab, we are not an agile uh, operational, we don't do agile with capital A, I'll say we do agile with the lowercase A. So we do not do everything perfectly and we never will, but we've adapted key pieces to be able to help us manage our students, our projects and provide better service to our patrons. So what does that mean in terms of agile implementation into the data and GIS lab? We have a Trello board that we can help manage all of our student projects. And so taking a look at this Trello board, we have what our project tasks are, our assignments, those are our backlogs. We have what students are currently working on. So at any given time, we can see that students are working on longer term projects. And then we have what are they blocked on or what's awaiting approval from someone else. And then what, what items are done. And so with all of that, we're able to better manage our students with their projects in going forward. Um, we also have weekly virtual standups. So um, those standups, right? Standups intended to be you stand around, you have a conversation for 15 minutes and you go. Ours are 30 minutes given the nature of our student employees, right? They're working for six to 10 hours a week. So our virtual meetings are 30 minutes and the focus of those are what are you working on? Are you stuck on anything? Do you have enough to continue to work um, on projects as well as what Patron questions are, are coming up. We do have quarterly in-person meetings where we get everyone together to, to create a more cohesive team. We have more formal retrospectives. So retrospectives, we're running ours in Retram, but there are other platforms out there such as Miro. We run um, retrospectives such as the 4L. So it's asking students to be able to say, what did you like? What did you learn? What did you lack? And what did you long for both in terms of project, the way our group is organized, as well as what patron support can, or what support can we give you to better manage the patron questions that you're getting. We're also doing backlog refinement. So prioritization of projects or tasks on the board um, as a group right now, it's more or less as an ad hoc rather than a specific um, two week interval. I would say we do it either sort of semi-weekly as well as in quarterly, we take a, a good look at that. And we also use Slack as our primary uh, communication channel with our library IT as well. Results, um, with constant employee turnover, <clears throat> excuse me, our Trello board and weekly meetings makes it easier for students to get into the flow of things. Weekly virtual meetings result in a more cohesive group who are willing to support each other. Improved communication through Slack resulted in fewer missed shifts and faster troubleshooting of patron questions. Students are self-starting new projects by adding cards to the Trello board. And retrospectives provide feedback that we can use to make continuous improvements. What's next? Uh, more retrospectives in addition to the four L's and you can see those on the right. More demos from students and staff. More dedicated time for backlog refinement and planning as we adapt, adjust, learn, and move forward to make a better space for students, staff, and patrons. Thank you. The, the, there's our contact email if you have any questions. Thank you both to Mike and Amy for an excellent presentation. I'm really interested in some of those agile concepts. Uh, 
Next, I am happy to introduce Joshua Sidvari and Michelle Hooper, both of The Ohio State University, on piloting a Sanborn Map GeoRefathon for GIS Day 2023. Hi, everybody. I'm going to get set here with my slides. Can you see my slides okay? All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh Zadvari, he, him. I'm the Geospatial Information Librarian at Ohio State. I'm happy to be presenting today on behalf of myself and my colleague, Michelle Hooper, who is with the Department of Geography and Center for Urban and Regional Analysis here. Um, I'll be discussing a new crowdsourced georeferencing activity that we piloted uh, during GIS Day 2023 sharing some information that hopefully will help others if they wanna try it at their own institutions. Uh, in terms of rationale, since we've returned to in-person GIS day programs over the last couple of years, we really try to focus on events that provide hands-on learning opportunities as much as possible. Um, we called this event the Columbus Sanborn Georefathon and it had both educational and research support value for us in terms of education. It's an active learning opportunity where we can highlight spatial and data literacy concepts related to data creation processes, such as transforming static digital maps into raster geospatial data. So kind of thinking about the same way that people have used humanitarian mapathons to highlight spatial and data literacy concepts. Um, and then it also provided us with an opportunity to highlight Sanborn maps and their potential value for historical research projects. Uh, in terms of research support, we also wanted to explore the feasibility of a crowdsourced georeferencing model for producing useful data sets in a scalable way. This is of interest for supporting historical GIS projects, such as the ongoing Ghost Neighborhoods of Columbus project led by Ohio State Center for Urban and Regional Analysis. For this event, we used the oldinsurancemaps.net platform, which was designed to support crowdsourced georeferencing of Sanborn maps from the Library of Congress collections. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but I'll highlight the aspects of this workflow most relevant to organizing a georefathon. In our case, this was preparing individual map sheets and georeferencing the prepared documents, which were the tasks carried out by participants. So in the platform, once a Sanborn volume has been loaded, all of the map sheets will initially be categorized as unprepared. Users can select an unprepared sheet to examine in the splitting interface. And if the sheet depicts only one contiguous area, users can choose the no split option, a no split needed option and move the sheet into the prepared category. However, if a sheet depicts multiple non-contiguous areas, users can draw cut lines to split the sheet into separate documents, each of which will then move into the prepared category. And this image shows a map sheet, number 643 from a Sanborn volume um, that has two non-contiguous areas that will be split into separate documents along the yellow lines. Prepared documents can be opened in the georeferencing interface, and it helps if event organizers georeference the key maps for a volume ahead of time, because this can be displayed as a reference layer before a user starts georeferencing. So in this image, I've panned and zoomed the key map in the pane on the right to the approximate location of the document displayed on the left based on the sheet number. And then after toggling off the key map, users can add control points for georeferencing by adding a point to the map document in the left pane and then adding a point to the corresponding real world location on the base map in the right pane. And when three control points have been added, a semi-transparent overlay appears, making it easier to add more control points. Once a user is satisfied with the results, they can submit the control points and the document moves into the georeference category. There's an optional trimming step to eliminate overlapping margins between sheets for a seamless mosaic, but during our georefathon, we only had participants work on preparing map sheets and georeferencing the prepared documents. But I should mention that once a, an individual map sheet has been georeferenced, it can be it becomes available for download as a geotiff or to be used as a web service, and then once a um, mosaic for a volume has been trimmed and prepared. Similarly, it becomes available for download or use as a web service. So that's a really nice feature. Um, to prepare for the event, we met with Adam Cox, the platform's developer in mid-September to discuss our plans. And Adam graciously agreed to load the requested volumes for Columbus 1915-51 uh, um, in support of our event and provided us with a lot of other valuable tips following his advice. We georeferenced the key maps ahead of time, used the classify layers functionality to mark them as key maps so they were available 
as reference layers for participants. Uh, the GeoRefathon facilitators also familiarized ourselves with the documentation on preparing sheets and georeferencing the documents so that we could answer participant questions on the day of the event. Um, we had two sessions, and across the two sessions, we had 30 unique participants. Each session started with a 30-minute presentation providing basic information about Sanborn maps, the georeferencing process, and tips for selecting control points, and the Ghost Neighborhoods Project as an example of research using georeferenced Sanborn maps. We also covered account setup in oldinsurancemaps.net and a demonstration of the workflow participants would be carrying out during the remaining 90 minutes. Um, overall, I, I think the sessions went really smoothly. We, we, we focused our work on 1951 volumes one, two, and three. And during the three total hours uh, of hands-on time across the two sessions, participants prepared and georeferenced 233 out of 313 map sheets and carried out the preparation step for another 53 documents. So we were really impressed by the amount of work that was accomplished in such a short, short time with mostly brand new users to the platform. And that's what you can see in this image. Very few of the participants indicated they had used or even heard of Sanborn maps before the GRF-a-thon. So I think that illustrates the awareness raising aspect of these types of activities. And during the afternoon session, I also had an impromptu consultation with a participant about how they could use a desktop GIS to georeference a different scan map for their graduate research and a similar consultation with a different participant about two weeks later. So it was nice to see that people were making connections with their own research, even if they wouldn't necessarily be using Sanborns or this particular platform directly. Um, in terms of after the event, the number of georeference maps for 1951 volumes one through three has risen from 233 to 299, indicating some users continued work on their own afterwards. And also shortly after the event, the facilitators received an email from one of these participants noting that they were also adjusting control points for some of the maps where it looked like participants had georeferenced the sheets to the key map rather than the modern base map. Um, despite our instructions and they just wanted to alert us for quality control purposes. And so in terms of like takeaways, I, I think that participants in these types of events will take away different things, um, but there's an educational value in highlighting historical map collections and the availability of crowdsourcing platforms like oldinsurancemaps.net that they may go on to, to use on their own. Um, and these activities also illustrate concepts related to the process of geospatial data, like data creation workflows and data quality considerations, um, but they also result in the product of geospatial data, one that can be of varying quality. And so the feasibility of using these data in research projects remains an open question for us that we will continue to explore, hopefully in collaboration with student employees who will perform some quality control tasks. So we thought this was a really fun and engaging activity. We would encourage others to explore how these kinds of crowdsourced georeferencing events might align with their own goals. Uh, and just very quickly, um, a quick thanks to everyone who helped make the GeoRefathon possible, especially Adam Cox for generously offering support time and expertise. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I would love to give a big round of applause to all of our presenters in this session. Uh, all of these fabulous, I have learned so much and I'm sure all of you have learned some new things as well. We have about 20 minutes now for questions. Uh, I know we've had some excellent activity going on in the chat, uh, but feel free to raise your hand, ask questions out loud, or continue to put questions in the chat. Yes, John. Hi. Um I just really enjoyed this session very much. Every, everything <laughs> from uh, Wade and Christina's work to the um, the most recent uh, talk by Josh. Um, my question is for Wade and Christina, and I didn't really dig down in deeply into the categories that you all covered in terms of core competencies. But um, so I, my question might be. Um, based on inadequate knowledge. But one of the things that I've been finding as a, a, a big demand is kind of an intersection with data services and data science that I've been um, running into. 
And the consequent expertise that I've been asked for and the library functionality I've been asked for is really about data management and data curation. Um, you know, being able to set up web portals, uh, being able to support um, NSF grant proposals with sustainability statements and, and that sort of stuff. Has that come up in your work on, on updating core competencies? Uh, well, thanks for the question, John. And Christina, I'll just take this real quick. Uh, certainly it's a iterative process. So perhaps the next round of core competencies will mention some of those things more directly. But since it comes from the, you know, the ALA roundtable, we're really only validating the ones that people listed in you know 2018. So ah. of course, with new requirements, the jobs keep changing. And uh, hopefully I'm around to do a decade update for a while. But you know, someone, someone will. Oh, cool. Uh, well, I, I'll keep in informal correspondence with you on that way, because I'm. And, I'm and I'll just to jump in uh, to plug the program. There's a, at UTK, there's a research data management certificate program uh, for anybody who's interested in developing those skills. And uh, I took a data curation class as part of that, which was really, really helpful. Well, and I must say, I was really inspired by our colleagues from Calgary. I, I, I thought those are, I'm, I'm at a small college, so I need quick and dirty solutions for just throwing up data portals and whatnot. And uh, I was dismayed about, I, I just looked up experience builder for the first time. And I can see, uh, yeah, that, that's got a bit of a learning curve compared to the old app builders, but um, those are really good, simple solutions. I'm looking forward to seeing more on your Calgary website about the apps that you've built. So thank you everybody. Yes, Mike and Amy. So I had a question for Karina. I'm thinking about, um, you had mentioned you had used the developer version of the web app builder and now you're transitioning to the experience builder. Are you planning to use the experience builder that's in the online platform? Or I, I guess I'm curious of like, I know there's many platforms and if you can speak of like why you chose to use the developer version and what your thoughts are in moving to the experience builder. Um, yeah, I should have clarified, uh, we are going to use the developer edition uh, experience builder. So it will be on our own server. Um, so before I went into the library setting, I was with facilities and IT, and it required a lot more customization of the apps that were being built over there. So when I came here, I kind of brought that knowledge with me. And then as I gotten through more projects as uh, in a library setting, I noticed that there weren't as complex. So it's a little bit of an overkill being on the server, honestly. Um, but, you know, gives us a nice URL to pass around. We can put our own logos on it. Uh, we can tweak the colors to University of Calgary colors. Um, I do some minor modifications of some of the widgets. Um, you know, maybe I don't like the placement, the logo, something like that, but nothing too, too complex. But I like the flexibility of having it on the server just in case we do need to build a custom widget someday. Thank you. Yes, Wade. Yeah, sorry. No, no, we're, um, I want to make sure there's time for everyone to ask questions, but I was just so curious with all of these talks, like how much of this shows up in the job descriptions? Was anyone hired to do the kind of things we're having to do? There are a couple of job descriptions out there. Um, recently, people may may be aware of those. If not, uh, yeah, go to Chronicle or ALA job list. Um, surprising to see two GIS librarian jobs advertised at once these days. But uh, I I will just note that uh, I spoke with uh, colleagues at, at one of those institutions that were involved in the search and uh, they were you know, there's a lot of GIS um, expertise scattered throughout that university. And the librarian 
Dean's pitch to the provost was, hey, this is where we can curate everything for people. And so again, just back to my original point, uh, that's that's something that that is uh, one of the core things in that uh, particular job description. And I've, I've found a similar sort of thing in my own experience at, at Lafayette College is that people in environmental sciences and our engineering division, civil and environmental engineering, they have good GIS training as early as graduate school, if not undergraduate. And they're not my big demand. My, my big demand is in the humanities and in the social sciences, especially the humanities where they, you know, they have a, a, a very simplistic view of what a map is. There's a little bit of, you know, geo-humanities theoretical work, which, you know, I find a little dubious, quite frankly. Um, and so you really kind of have to explain maps in terms of, you know, my, my subject graduate training, which is geography, which, you know, that's always a tough sell, especially in the United States. But map is a model of something on the surface of the earth and that has a historiography that's 2500 years old at least in the west so, sorry to go off on that tangent but uh, anyway that's my answer amy and mike and i think you know way to answer your question i think both mike and i have managed data in gis lab and that was about it in terms of ours and the job description, but really applying some of the other things that I'll say I've been acquiring as part of other responsibilities in the library that I've been taking on. Um, but I think to answer Sarah's question in the in the chat sort of about digital scholarship labs have a broader scope, and I'll say my library um, had a position for digital scholarship library in which we were under the framework of do we rename the lab? We also have another lab in our library called a digital media lab. Uh, which was really handling sort of three-dimensional virtual reality for a while, 3D printing, and so there are two separate spaces. Um, that position also is currently vacant, and so it's trying to figure out, um, while we're data and GIS, I think we do support larger digital scholarship components within that lab. It's just, it used to be called, I think, is it just a GIS lab? And then it got added data and it got named data and GIS because there's more room in front of GIS to put data on the wall. So I think I think that's how it acquired its name. Is that right? So we do have a broader scope, but that's just the title of our lab. Then I have another question I'm gonna ask um, Josh. And thinking about you've done that uh, the geo referencing a thon. How many times would you do that? Right? Would you, like you've done it? Um, would you do? Is that something that you would do once a year? Would you do it like more times a year? Like given the amount of right like lift that it takes to get to do events, but also then the return on investment that you've got. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I, I will say that since we did it uh, on GIS Day, we tried to do another one during Love Data Week, and it was much less attended. I, we only had about four participants. We were working on more difficult areas of the city where there was a lot of development, so it didn't go as smoothly as the first one. Um, I think my thoughts after that have come around to... Um, we do an annual GIS day event every year. We kind of have a built-in audience for that. There's a lot of interest. That's a really good time of the year to do it because you can sort of count on, at least here, we can count on a decent amount of participation. Um, outside of that, I think I'm, I would look to coordinate it more with maybe student associations uh, or units on campus that have like broadly interest in that topic. So for example, if we have an undergraduate student history or geography or urban planning association, kind of reaching out to them and saying, you know, would you be interested in having this as kind of like a co-sponsored event that the folks in your association can learn from and just a fun activity and we as the libraries can facilitate it. So I think I, 
I would think more purposefully about create uh, having an audience ready to go through those other kinds of university structures than doing it more often as a public event where, you know, we really can't always count on attendance except for around GIS day. So like around GIS day, the things we try to do are the humanitarian mapathons or this, we tried out those sorts of hands-on activities, occasionally like a workshop, um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Really kind of like finding strategically who are the groups on campus that might have an interest and really benefit from learning something. Any other questions, comments, thoughts folks want to share? We have about 10 more minutes before we'll take a short break before uh, session three starts. Yeah, since I'm being a little mouthy, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, everybody who organized this. I think uh, Leap in, into McGirt is great. It, and it I must say, it really helps me out um, in terms of my travel budget and so forth. So it's it's really nice to see everybody. And uh, I'm going to sign off and go off into another realm. But thank you once again. Thank you, John. And I'm going to uh, read aloud Alyssa's question in the chat uh, for our recording purposes. Is anyone aware if geography departments are growing or shrinking? My institution never had one. And I imagine these departments usually have leaders that are involved in these libraries. Looks like a good area for research. Mike. This is purely conjecture, but um, I think uh, geography departments started dying out like the 70s and 80s. And it seemed like an easy thing to cut out of the curriculum. And then like 10 years later, all this GIS is going on and now we don't have the department anymore. But I think uh, the existing departments have been um, growing because of that. Um, I would say the same thing. Yeah, I mean, so I I I come from that geography background and sort of seeing, and it, it is that those departments that are still existing after that sort of closure of some of them are growing and they're growing in different areas. And I think it used to be GIS, and now I think it's GIS as um, at least from some parts, right, are, are integrated in different thematic areas as well as then GIS in other programs, right? The business school, the health. Um, and so it's, it's, I don't know, it's flipped on that, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, Others may have better information. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I uh, should have said before, so I worked at Northwestern University and they had a geography department going back like a hundred years and in the 80s they got rid of it and it, it, they kept one guy um john hudson who has written this uh textbook that everyone used um around for like 20 years and it missed out on on gis So, uh, I was just going to say my uh, my sense. It's been a while since I was looking at this, but it's not geography is not being taught in elementary or secondary schools any longer in most cases in the U.S. Um, so there's no real pipeline for people to move into those departments in higher education. Is my, that's my I would have to go back and check to find out where my sources were for that, but that was the impression that I got. And I'll just add too that Tara has linked what looks like a pretty interesting article in the chat from December 2022 about the state of geography, data and trends in higher education. So that looks like it's worth a read. 
And I, I thought I'd add a, uh, a little nugget from, I learned as a grad student, it's the, the, the historical origin in the United States was um, Harvard uh, getting rid of its geography department in 1945, right after the war. And it was all part of a personal scandal. There was actual, you know, very complicated personal story. But what I understand the upshot was is that the geography department in 1946 basically upstakes and we're all hired by Clark. So um, Clark's geography department is actually a legacy of, of a lot of people from Harvard. And uh, you can read that history. It's kind of shocking. Uh, I don't have a link to it right away, but and uh, yeah, and it, it was ironic that I think Michigan got rid of its geography department around 1980. Uh, Chicago did the same. And uh, on the flip side, there's also a, a role for this uh, technology uh, within more of an engineering and a sciences thing. So at the University of Maine, um, the old NCGIA um, consortium consisted of Maine and Buffalo and Santa Barbara. Maine, however, is not a geography department. It's spatial information engineering. And ditto Johns Hopkins dropped geography from the title of their department, and it's now simply a, uh, a sciences and engineering department. So not only does geography get dinged just before all of that funding and, and interest of GI science come on in the 80s and 90s, but we've also lost geography departments simply because they want to pigeonhole it into the engineering space and uh, and not think about the human experience. We've got just a few more minutes before I want to wrap for break, or we can wrap for break a few minutes early. Uh, any final questions, thoughts, anything folks would like to share out on this session? All right, I think we can wrap session two a few minutes early. Uh, take a quick walk, whatever you'd like to do. And I hope we'll see most of you for session three in eight minutes at half past. So thank you everybody. Big round of applause again for everyone in session two and session one this morning. Uh, have learned so much so far and I hope everyone else is enjoying themselves as well. See you in a few minutes. All right, so we ready to do this then. Hello, so. everyone. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to session three of Leap into McGirt. Um, starting out, we have, well, we have a few presentations and one lightning talk in this final session. To start with, we have Sung Kim and Peter Hauge from the Los Angeles Public Library, as well as independent consultant Richard Hulser bringing us the WALMAP project, digitization, cataloging metadata, and digital access. We can see your screen just fine, so please take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon. Peter Hauge, Richard Holzer, and I'll be presenting about the WALMAP collection at the Los Angeles Public Library and the digitization description and digital access grant project we completed about a few months ago. Peter will start us off. So hi, uh, my name is Peter Hauke and I am the map librarian here at uh, Los Angeles Public Library. Um, one of the things that's gonna be mentioned a little bit uh, later on or discussed uh, during this uh, presentation is um, 
just how during the course of this project, uh, there were some staffing changes, and I was one of those changes. Uh, this project began in uh, 2019 when Glenn Creason was our map librarian, and that's a position that he held here for uh, over 30 years. Uh, he retired in uh, 2021, uh, and I did not become the map librarian until August of 2023. So some of my first experiences with this project didn't really start until the tail end of its uh, completion. Um, but I can already say that this whole project has made a huge, huge impact already in our collection. It is what a difference it has made. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we have been collecting maps uh, at LAPL here for uh, over 130 years, as long as the library has been around. Um, in 1891, there was an uh, inventory that was done. We had 104 uh, inventoried and catalog maps. 1926, that had grown to 5,000. Uh, during World War II, uh, we had the addition of the Army Map Service materials, and the collection has just been growing ever since. Uh, I believe that we have one of the largest collections of maps in a public library uh, in the country. Um, you'll see some counts uh, in the uh, 85,000s, other counts in the 100s to 200,000s. I still believe that it's, uh, it's a bit more than that. We have a lot of materials. Um, we, uh, we focus mostly on uh, the city of Los Angeles, uh, followed by the, the county, followed by the state, uh, but our holdings include just about everything. Uh, we have road maps, topographical maps, uh, street guides, sandborn maps. Uh, we have a huge collection of nautical charts. Uh, it is a very, very broad uh, collection, um, but very few have been scanned. A lot of our uh, core collection or a lot of our uh, really important or useful maps uh, have been scanned or available on our website. Um, but uh, but not a lot of them. Scanning is something that uh, is something that we've sort of been easing into uh, pretty pretty gently. Um, uh, if we can go to the the next slide, um, the uh, big part of our or an important part of our collection, I should say, uh, it's a smaller one. Um, but uh, of course, we're here to talk about our roller maps. Uh, these are the very large maps that were hung on the walls of real estate developers, uh, urban planners, delivery companies, transportation authorities. Um, these were very valuable tools and very useful maps uh, back then, and they are still very, very valuable tools uh, to researchers uh, today. Uh, we have a collection of about 120 uh, wall maps. Um, and before this project was completed, uh, these maps were inaccessible. Uh, they had not been seen in decades. Even the, uh, uh, the finding aid that we had uh, was already uh, long outdated. Uh, the maps had been moved many, many times, uh, but the condition of them uh, was something that was uh, very apparent. They were uh, very fragile. Uh, there was mold uh, on some of these maps. Um, they were, they were uh, a, a tough project to um, or a, a tough item in our, uh, our collection to, to really deal with. Uh, when I became involved with this project, uh, one of the first things I did um, was I went to see what uh, Mary Larsgaard has to say about, uh, about wall maps. So cracked open my copy of Map Librarianship, and it's very simple. Um, wall maps are the problem children of a map collection. They're big, they're fragile, they're difficult to store. Uh, and this project really addresses all of those issues. Uh, it takes some of the toughest uh, items in a map collection and it's really uh, tackled them head on. Um, these were urgent maps uh, to get uh, to get scanned and, uh, and digitized. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, these uh, these maps now um, that we that we've made available uh, they answer some of the most common questions that we receive from both casual patrons and serious researchers. Um, although they were uh, troublesome maps, they uh, are very useful maps. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing that we have them available. Uh, questions we receive are uh, like uh, you all probably get about your map collection, but uh, what were the boundaries of such and such neighborhood or such and such city uh, during this time, uh, during the 1940s, let's say? Uh, how far did this street extend and when was it expanded? Uh, what did the transportation system of Los Angeles look like uh, back in its heyday? Uh, and these were all things that uh, this this wall map collection really addresses. So. Um, it's it's very simple. A very large map like these can show you a lot of information and uh, the ability to now study these maps uh, with so much detail and clarity. Um, I think it's really something that has uh, uh, done these maps uh, a lot of justice. So 
Um, it's been a, a really wonderful project. It has done uh, amazing things for our collection. And like I say, it, they have just been incredibly, incredibly useful for, uh, for folks to use. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Sung, who's going to give us a little bit more uh, background about the, uh, the project itself and just how we went about uh, um, getting this all done. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Sung Kim. I am the Librarian 3 in the Digitization and Special Collections Department at the Los Angeles Public Library. I specialize in digitization and digital preservation work, and I was the second project manager for this uh, project. The WALMAP project was the inaugural digitization project utilizing camera-based equipment within our department. The project was initiated by Annie Boya Jian, uh, Principal Librarian of Research and Special Collections at LAPL, and Imani Harris, Senior Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at Library Foundation of Los Angeles. And this was made possible by generous grants from the Haynes Foundation. As you can see in the timeline, it took about 24 months spread out in four years to complete the project. Um, mainly because there were few major challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic and unforeseen staffing changes. As you can see, um, different from our anticipation in the beginning, many tasks were being completed simultaneously when we reopened the project in early 2023. It taught us that being flexible is really important and managing complex logistics and multi-directional communication is also vital in project management. In this chart, uh, you can see that tasks involving the imaging, post-imaging work, researching, cataloging metadata work cost us a lot of hours. It was mainly because we needed to be trained and develop new workflows to start with. Unlike those tasks, providing digital access and creating finding aid wasn't um, as difficult because we have existing workflows that are well documented and efficient. Some of the challenges we um, experienced while working on this project included, um, again, the COVID-19 pandemic, which put us in almost two year pause. Also the discovery of inactive mold at a time in the preparation phase. However, we follow the LA City of Occupational Safety and Health Division's recommendations, and we resolve this issue in timely manner. Experiencing sudden staffing change um, also prompted us to backtrack a lot of work that's already been done. However, um, we overcame this through discussions and meetings among staff members and the contract archivist. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry, let me go back to the slide. Um, my bad. Um, oops, I am going back many, many slides and my internet connection is pretty slow. There we go. Okay, and then let me go back to share screen. Oh, okay, I'm gonna add a few more uh, uh, sentences about the challenges. Um, the wall maps were in very poor condition and um, the imaging work required multiple staff uh, to handle them at the same time. This posed some difficulties in arranging time to meet regularly to train, have discussions, and do the actual digitization work. Also, some vital information was hidden in the damaged sections of the map, whether they'd be warped or partially cut out. Uh, Richard, our contract archivist, and I communicated virtually about this by exchanging many images about the problematic areas and the um, manipulating them by using Photoshop to bring out less visible information. And lastly, even though the grant project is completed, we still have some more work to do, such as rehousing the maps and preserving the digital files. This will require a significant amount of time carved out in the next three to four months. All of the challenges I listed um, can be also begins for us as we move forward with other digitization projects. 
first we can uh, now say that we are comfortable handling and imaging oversizing oversized items and managing a digitization grant project. We have now very well documented workflows and great collegial relationships with staff from other depart departments. Through utilizing multiple software applications, some already familiar, but some new, we can add them to our resume under the technology section. And when we tackle the rehousing task, we'll gain experience in some basic preservation techniques and knowledge in different archival supplies. Lastly, I would say the biggest gain is that we've made lots of connections with many immigrant members, such as Louis Redleaf and Tim Kaiser and many other um, folks who helped us with resources. And we are very, very thank you. Um, we are very thankful that you um, gave us a lot of information, um, connected with other people, and also responding to my cold emails. Now I will turn it over to our, our contract archivist, Rachel Husser. Yeah, thanks, Asung. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, I'm a longtime ALA member and a recent McGirt member, but um, uh, just a brief uh, background. Um, my last uh, full-time position was at, as responsible for the um, research collection and the archives for the Natural History Museum at Los Angeles uh, Museum of Natural History uh, and uh, and the Tar Pits. You may be familiar with the Tar Pits. And I have an Earth and Space Sciences undergrad degree. And I work as an independent consultant. And I was actually the second consultant hired by LAPL, the Los Angeles Public Library, among all those many staffing changes they had. And so came onto the project early in 2023. And uh, more information about me, and should you need a contract archivist or a person like me uh, can be found on LinkedIn. So uh, if you would go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the research process, uh, part of the contract was uh, for me was to help with the research on uh, with out of the 120 wall maps, there were 92 that were identified uh, as physically existing of course, some are still missing, we know, uh, or, and are in scope, meaning they were either uh, specifically dealing with Los Angeles itself or the state of California uh, or the Western region. If they just dealt with, for instance, there were there's a wall map of Sid Seattle, uh, be, for the purposes of this, this particular project, that was set aside. So out of the 120, 92 were, were done. And so one of the aspects of the project was to do research about all of them, to catalog them, and uh, and then uh, to give guidelines on how to rehouse uh, them for preservation purposes and uh, future access. So, uh, and in my old job uh, at the Natural History Museum, we had 15 map cases with maps, huge maps, as well as other kinds of, all sorts of maps as well. So the research was conducted using a variety of resources, uh, a lot of through the help of Louise Ratliff and Tim Kaiser uh, and some of their workshops and whatnot, as well as uh, using OCLC to determine ownership of, of the maps by other organizations and whatever cataloging they had so we weren't reinventing the wheel. Uh, what was interesting was the OCLC records for the maps often had just limited information and having dealt with maps myself for many years in different ways in different organizations. Uh, that's and all of you fully understand that, uh, you know, getting to that kind of detail. Uh, some had different measurements from the ones we had uh, or were not the same year or edition, which sometimes is OK and sometimes uh, not OK if we wanted accuracy for the records. And there were many advantages and challenges working with the digital maps files remotely. So the way it worked was uh, we have uh, downtown central, the main uh, offices of the library. And I work out of my home in West Hollywood, California, which is about a 40 minute drive. Uh, and so what was great about that was I didn't have to deal with traffic and all the other good things we all learned by the through the pandemic, although I used to work remotely many years before that in corporations and whatnot, on and off. So, uh, so that was one thing. The other thing was that because uh, Sung and team had digitized the maps, uh, it minimized the amount of handling that was for these very fragile 
maps. And so so that was really good. And also by me being uh, not needing space to work, uh, her team and, and the other folks uh, could use the very valuable uh, real estate, as it were, in their offices for other things. And, uh, and also, I wasn't there to get in the way with all of their projects. The challenges were that, as Sung mentioned, when there were questions about, uh, gee, there's some information missing, or the, we found early on, it took a little bit of iteration to realize that uh, we needed to have all of the files on an external drive to the laptop I was assigned, as well as use Photoshop to really be able to manipulate them and expand them to take a look at details of the maps to properly get the information off of them. So those were some of the challenges. So if I can go to the next, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so what's interesting was research and cataloging interlock and intertwine. Uh, several maps had no printed date. It was kind of disappointing to me that the uh, Thomas uh, Thomas uh, Maps company that's been around for a long, long time. There was a section of time where they just they even had copyright notices, but not the map date. So. I had to use other methodologies as many of you are probably very familiar with. Uh, so how did, did I do that? Well, the handwritten notations on the maps or mailing labels, such as you see in the lower left picture was one way I did that as well as uh, enhancing uh, some of the maps using the tools, uh, electronic tools that you, you couldn't see in the actual map if you physically looked at it. So there was that. Uh, other map, information or I should, should say other information on the map, such as uh, census data tables uh, with the years included, at least enabled a, a section of time for assigning some, uh, well, this map must have been done between 1941, probably in 49, because it includes census data from 1940. So that helped a lot. Uh, lots of research about the creators, the printers, the distributors, was important uh, and a comparison to dated maps from the same creator, although again, working remotely, one of the challenges was I couldn't just get up and go and, and talk to Peter and his team and say, hey, could we look at some maps? I think they're part of a certain group of maps and get some data. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you an example of uh, the Seabold, what was labeled after enhancement, the reservoir lands of city and county of Los Angeles from 1871. And what's amazing about this one is that there's a similar map at the Natural History Museum, it turns out, in the Seaver Center for Western History and Research, but it doesn't have the exact same designations because these were hand created. And also the, uh, the fact that uh, we didn't really understand what reservoir lands meant. And it turns out there was a company called Canal and Reservoir Lands. And so this map, which was done by Seabold, uh, was of their holdings. And, and if you look closely, as you see on the right, you can see the names of people who held land there. And so Los Angeles in the 1800s was a very, very small and, and low population area. And then with the aqueduct in 1913 uh, and access to water and everything else, the population exploded. And so looking at these old maps and comparing them to newer ones is one justification for why would you spend all this effort and time to work on all of these? So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the metadata process you see on the right, I had two laptops with several spreadsheets as well as access to OCLC and uh, the Photoshop uh, so I could look at the maps. So, and plus my own handwritten notes because I'm that old. But uh, anyways, uh, using RDA for uh, cataloging and uh, capturing all the data in spreadsheets so they could be uploaded into the image management system content DM and also the library system Tessa. Um, we were able to find all that information about the creators and whatnot. There were some iterations needed for remeasuring the scales and then using tools like uh, online measurement conversion tools, as well as bounding box for the uh, coordinates. Uh, which are also challenges. And then finally, using those spreadsheets to fill in information for creating a finding aid on archive space. So next slide. Oops, uh, we'll turn it over back to Song. 
Yeah, so thank you, Richard. Um, so as the result of the project, we have a page on our digital portal, tessa.lapl.org, which you're more than welcome to go visit and uh, take a look. And also our um, finding aid now lives on um, in archive space, but we'll have it published on online archive of California pretty soon. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please contact Peter, me, or Richard. All right. Thank you, everybody. We can also handle questions in the chat, and we hope to have some time for questions and answers for everyone at the end of the session. So continuing from LA, up next we have Maggie Tarmi from UCLA with Mapping the Uncharted. Enhancing Accessibility of the Henry J. Bruman Map Collection. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back, since pretty much all of y'all saw me, uh, session two. And yes, happy to be part of our LA contingent that's here. Let me just move all my Zoom windows around. Every time I turn on Zoom, uh, everything just goes psh. But yes, I am Maggie Tarmi. I use he, they pronouns. I am a humanities and social sciences librarian, liaison to geography, maps, and economics at UCLA. It is quite a mouthful. Uh, to get into this, I need to go over some background of the UCLA map collections and my positionality and current relationship to this collection. I started this job July 3rd of last year. This is my first capital L librarian role. I was at UCLA for two years previous to that as a graduate student, and now I am here full-time in this role. I have no prior background in uh, maps or map librarianship. I do have an archives background, which has really come in handy working with these map collections. Now, uh, some big numbers here. Uh, I know the map folks here are definitely going to realize this is a big number. And when I arrived, I learned that we have approximately three quarters of a million maps at UCLA held across three separately administered locations. This provides for some really interesting challenges, uh, some really interesting interactions in terms of how to actually answer reference questions, handle teaching, and, and find literal maps in an efficient manner uh, has proven to be quite interesting. And it's still a system even seven or so months in that I'm still learning how to navigate. Really briefly, the three locations we're focusing today on the Charles E. Young Research Library. It's where I'm sitting right now. And that is where the maps that fall sort of under my purview, uh, I joke sometimes it's my tiny fiefdom, uh, reside. These maps are open stacks. Uh, they are global coverage of post-1945 materials, generally speaking, with a heavy emphasis on Southern California, even though there is a global coverage. And then another separately administered location is our geology library with about 100,000 maps across two different locations within the geology library. Uh, the first floor is, mostly, is the only circulating part of any of these collections. Uh, everything else is non-circulating. And then the second floor has our historical maps collection, which actually used to be located in my library. It moved before I came here of our pre-1945 historical maps. Shout out Louise, who has been in the chat and is here today. She cataloged all of those. She was our map cataloger, uh, who luckily for her and unluckily for me, retired before I started. But I am so grateful for the work that she has done every day. Uh, it saves my butt in a lot of situations, knowing how strong these catalog records are. And then we also have an unknown but many thousands of maps in the Southern Regional Library Facility, or SRLF. That is our off-site storage facility that is actually located on-site at UCLA. However, it is not only a UCLA facility. It is for all southernly located University of California campuses. So UCLA uses it quite a bit. It's on the UCLA campus, but it is for all five Southern UC campuses, not just us. So I arrived, I started this job in the summer and I was assigned the maps as a liaison area. And I almost immediately started getting really complex reference questions. As soon as my name popped up as librarian supporting maps on the website, the emails really started to flood in. 
Uh, I, of course, was asking a lot of questions. I really resonated with Sierra's lightning talk this morning about her first month as a map librarian in Michigan. Uh, I asked a lot of questions. There were not a lot of answers for me. Do we have a collection development policy and can I see it? There is no collection development policy at this time. Am I allowed to purchase maps? There is a moratorium on purchasing and collecting at this time. Uh, where is documentation about X, Y, and Z? A uh, lot, of, lot of shrugs. So I realized pretty quickly, we aren't super sure what we actually have in this collection in the YRL building that I work in. I would try to answer reference questions and it was really time consuming, inefficient and challenging. I'd encounter bizarre situations. Uh, I opened a folder labeled American Civil War maps and inside that folder were maps of Lithuania, Palestine and the USSR. Uh, that is not the only situation like that that I encountered. I had quite a few of those, partially in, due to having open stacks and partially due to not having a maps specific person. For some time, there was a gap between myself and my full-time predecessor who had retired. Uh, and frankly, this is really discouraging for patrons to try to use, right? If I could barely utilize it, as a librarian, again, albeit brand spanking new librarian, but still, I had to imagine it was almost impossible for patrons to actually find maps that they wanted to use. So not only did I wanna make my job easier and make research easier, but I realized that there were years of collection neglect that I really wanted to work towards repairing to make this excellent collection as good as it could be. So I decided to conduct an inventory of this section of the collection within the Charles E. Young Research Library. So there we go. Moving into the inventory process itself. What is it? What does it look like? What are we doing? I wanna emphasize this is an ongoing project. We are not done. So part of this is to share an outline for what I've been doing. So if you are interested in doing this at your own location, you can pull some advice and tips. But also, if you have done something similar and have advice or tips, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I would love that. I have loved the support I've gotten from McGirt, WAML members. Uh, I'm always here to take advice from folks. And before anything else getting into the inventory process, I really, really want to address labor. Inventorying this large of a collection, or really any collection, but especially this one this large, is so time and labor intensive. Without the support of my two undergraduate student workers, of which they work a combined 20 to 25 hours a week, this project would literally not be possible. My two students who support this work, I really think it's important for me to shout them out, are Veronica, a third year undergraduate studying geography and sociology, and Quinn, a second year undergraduate studying geography and statistics. I think labor and glam spaces really often goes unrecognized and it is my imperative that my students and their labors that supports this important, important project uh, is recognized and that they are recognized for the truly incredible work that they do. And again, I literally could not do this project without them. Uh, so please, big shout outs to them. I am thankful for them every day. And for some context, and since I'm guessing a lot of us map folks are thinking spatially, this is how the YRL collection is laid out. So all of these are different banks of map drawers, and then these larger collections we refer to as banks. Uh, and then each of these banks are 15 map drawers high for a total of 300 drawers in this left-hand side. And then these are all 10 drawers high uh, which actually also comes out to 300 drawers. So we have 600 total drawers and virtually all of these are entirely full to the point of pretty much being overstuffed. So we're working with 600 stuffed drawers of maps here to inventory. So we're gonna go through this piece by piece. It's a lot of, a lot of info, but this is the first of our two major inventory sheets. And this is our folder by folder sheet. This first segment I have highlighted here is really standard location information. What bank is the folder located in? What drawer? What does the current label read? And what information is listed on the folder? This second section, again, uh, is the highlighted as the display call number is listed on the folder. The series title for what's actually in 
those folders. And then if there's links to digital catalog records, if we can find them, we attach those under the arrow where the series link is. So again, not the sexiest information, but still very important to have and keep track of. Now, my favorite part and definitely the most interesting section is columns G, H, and I. What are the regions featured on the maps in the folder? What is the date range of the maps in the folder? What is the approximate count of maps in the folder? Yes, they should be two separate columns. Uh, I'm going to split them and open refine later. Somehow we ended up making them into two columns and I'm not quite sure, but that's also fine by me. And then the type of maps or the contents shown on the map. My students and I have gone back and forth quite a bit on how granular we want our descriptions to be for these columns. 100% item level processing immediately thrown out. Uh, this many maps, way too time consuming to even attempt to go for like item level processing. So we've decided on being really specific with our individual regions to the best of our ability, where in this case, you can see it's California counties and the specific counties that are included in that folder. And then for column I with type and content of maps, we've gone with a general use your best judgment call of what seems most prevalent and relevant in that folder. Particularly in folders with many different types of thematic maps, it's way too clunky to try and list every single type of thematic map we could possibly see in a folder. We would have cells this big and we would spend more time trying to make sure we've included everything. We realize that that's not useful. So at this point, we mark that there are thematic maps and then we throw in parentheses with the thematic maps, some of the key types of thematic maps that stick out or tend to appear over and over again. So in this first cell under column I in the screenshot, we have road maps and then thematic maps listed, including census tracts, agriculture, oil fields, mining and minerals, open space, soil, and then also geologic maps included in that folder. Uh, we're trying to make this relevant as possible in terms of answering reference questions and finding maps that people need without totally dragging out this process any longer than it's already taking. Uh, before having this resource, we've been kind of haphazardly pointing patrons towards a large number of drawers saying, here's 10 drawers where something that might be relevant to your project might be located, which justifiably kind of scares people away and leaves folks without having the information that they need for success in whatever they're trying to do. And then our final column here is a general notes column. So that's anything that is important to note, but doesn't really fit into any of our other uh, columns that we're recording. So we might have a note that a folder is really ripped and damaged and we need to replace the folder, whether there's maps in a folder that seem super out of place and would be more appropriate to be located somewhere else, errors with some digital catalog records, anything that stands out as this isn't quite right, something we might need to change, let's make a note of it. It's been super helpful to locate what problems keep occurring. And uh, as we start to repair these problems, we can then update uh, the notes accordingly. So our second of the two sheets is our drawer by drawer sheet as opposed to our folder by folder sheet. It's marking much of the same information as the last sheet, just at a less granular and higher level than of course the folder by folder information. Since we're already working with 600 drawers, so of course the sheet is going to be 600 rows long, Leaping right into the folder by folder sheet can be pretty challenging to parse through at times, especially again for answering reference questions, trying to locate specific maps or specific types of maps. So by starting my reference investigations at this drawer by drawer sheet, I can then identify relevant drawers and then move back to locating them in the folder by folder sheet to get that more granular information. So here, this first row of the sheet shows bank 5A drawer 14. And we see here that there are seven folders in this drawer. And again, a lot of pretty general content here that is not super exciting to look at. But if we go back to the previous slide, we see bank 5A drawer 14, and we have seven rows here for those seven folders that are in that drawer. So again, these are uh, different California counties sorted alphabetically. So if I get a student that says, I'm looking at 
uh, Fresno County in California and I'm looking for maps, information, anything that relates to Fresno County. So I know based on this sheet, Fresno, hopefully alphabetically, will be located in this drawer as Fresno should fall between Alameda and Lassen alphabetically. So I can take that, say drawer, bank 5A, drawer 14, go back and see that Fresno is located in the folder that has this label on it. And we can see the type of maps that are located. We've got about 30 maps here, and they're a mix of road maps, topographic maps, a couple types of thematic maps, and geologic maps in here as well. So it's been so, so useful, and I am uh, blown away by how, I'm not gonna say smoothly it's going because it's certainly not the smoothest process, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, but it's so much more useful than I had even hoped it would be. We started this process in early September. We're now on our fourth bank of maps, which comes to about 33% of the way through. And based on our rough counts of maps and folders, this is about 25,000 maps that we've inventoried, which is certainly no small feat. Uh, that's a win. The fact that we now know more about 25,000 maps that we have access to, I think is amazing. Another win for us has been uncovering so many gems that none of us really knew about in the collection. I have my students take notes of, map of maps of interest as they're going through. Again, personal judgment call on anything that seems really neat, useful, or interesting to them, right? And I have them send them to me and just mark where the location is. And I'm able to pull some of these particularly interesting maps for instruction and reference. And some people just want like a show and tell of maps that we have, which I'm also always more than happy to do. So I have now this sort of mini list of here's some really neat stuff I can pull out sort of on a whim because uh, you never know who's going to stop by. And it's really handy to have that as well. And also, my, again, like I said, reference, so much more efficient, and I'm able to provide so much better answers and just higher quality answers to folks. Uh, again, was really challenging to do that before. So far, it's getting a lot easier to do. Uh, and then we'll talk about that last bullet in the challenges section as well. But uh, again, not every reference question. We have not resolved all our reference problems. I'll get questions about specific individual maps. And if that map is not where it should be, we're kind of SOL until we find it in whatever random drawer it ended up in. But overall, again, so much more manageable. When it comes to challenges, a lot of unexpected surprises. A big one was the discovery of a few aerial photo sets. Uh, most folks, including myself and other library staff, didn't even know we had sets of aerial photos in the library. Uh, I'm now working on getting these cleaned up and usable when we dug them out of the drawers. Uh, it kind of looks like a tornado passed through some of the folders, so getting that cleaned up so we can use them. We're also kind of still struggling on how to learn to resolve repeated issues in an efficient manner. And I know that's not a super clear phrase, so let me kind of get into what that looks like. Our resources are limited. I only have so much time each week. I only have two students for so many hours each week. We've been trying to come up with more consistent processes for repeated issues that come up. In our case, things like a lot of folders are severely overstuffed with 150, 200 or more maps that are just really hard to manage, even just physically moving the folders. So we're trying to divide these into multiple different folders to make it much more manageable to actually use. Doing that and figuring out a process that isn't super time consuming for things like that is stuff that we're still working our way through. And then, of course, this is a slow and long process. Managing expectations someday just personally can kind of be a challenge, right? I've been asked more than a few times what the biggest shock of moving into a full time capital L librarian role has been compared to my previous roles. And I keep telling my, my these people that it's the move from timelines that are maybe an academic quarter or two in duration to project timelines that are multiple years long. And as you'll see, both a win and a challenge is learning a lot about project management. I have never tried to organize, facilitate, manage a project at this scope or scale before. I'm learning a lot about how to improve it and do it better. I am also learning you know, halfway through all these resources that would have been super useful at the start. Uh, I'm sure you all can relate. We've seen a lot of really big, interesting projects talked about today. 
there's a lot to learn about project management always. So I call that both a win and a challenge on my end. Finally, hopes for the future. Uh, I want to share my hopes and hopes and dreams, starting small, moving big, right? I want to be able to update our signage and drawer labels. A lot of them are not complete. And then our signage is right now just uh, plain text, plain black text on white printer paper that is not very interesting, visual, good to look at. And then the drawer labels, I'm always encouraging students to browse drawers in person, try to get out of our screens a little bit more. And it's great to touch the stuff, as I always like to say. But that's really hard to do as our some of our drawer labels are totally wrong, right? So as we keep going through this project, being able to update these labels to make them more accurate. Also hoping to create some digital catalog records for series that are currently undiscoverable in the digital format. We still have lots of people that prefer digital browsing in our online catalog. Folks who are nervous about the idea of coming in person to touch the stuff or people who just don't come in person. Uh, I want to be able to do a little more of that. Very broadly, better understand and utilize our holdings so we can make the most of these amazing maps. The word activate gets thrown around a lot in archives, but I really do want to activate this map calendar and highlight its many strengths. I'm almost done, I promise, my last slide. And then ultimately, we spent all morning talking about weeding and deaccessioning. And ultimately, I hope we can use this as a resource to identify and remove duplicates across our multiple managed uh, map library locations, as well as a larger guide for broader uh, deaccessioning, or as we like to call it at UCLA, respectful disposition as a whole. We have maybe four empty drawers out of our 600 UCLA, like everyone else struggling for space. If I can free up a lot more drawers, I hope to be able to actively build and curate this already great collection into something better. So thank you all for your time. And uh, I hope I'll have some questions from you all later on. All right, thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, moving back into the middle of the country a little bit. Up next, we have Susan Moore to share with us about scaling up, calculating scale for cartographic resources. All right, screen is up, looking good. Okay, just momentarily lost my mute thing. So we're we're good now. Here we are, we are doing math now, people. Um, scaling up, sc calculating scale for cartographic resources. Purpose of this presentation is to provide an introduction or a refresher on how to calculate scale for a map from verbal scale statements. And also to cover calculating scale either using a natural scale indicator or scale finder or a ruler for calculating scales from bar scales. Um, this a refresher scale or scale is always recorded as a representative fraction. Units of measurement don't matter that way. A unit measure on the map is equal to that same measure unit of measure on the ground. So that's why we, we have to do the math. Numerator is always one. The scale statement provides an indication on how detailed the map is. So that's why we do this. The smaller the denominator, the larger the scale of the map, or thus the more detailed the map is. The larger the denominator, the smaller the scale of the map. Should we all know this? So verbal scale statements, they very often apply appear close to the title on a sheet map. Uh, they can appear in multiple different ways, like one inch, is one inch to two miles, one centimeter equals approximately 10.5 kilometers. For unfamiliar links, a converter like onlineconversion.com slash link is very helpful that they will, you can go there and you can find out there are different different links of leagues. There's French leagues and English leagues. So yeah, who knew? Uh, for familiar links, uh, there are 63,360 inches in one mile, and of course, 100,000 centimeters in a kilometer. So for our, my scale statements that I had up here earlier, we have to 
one inch to two miles, we have to divide 63,360 by two. So our scale is one to 31,680. And our scale statement for the kilometers is one to 1,500,000 or 50,000, sorry. Graphic scales, also known as bar scales, they're fairly common on base maps because when you're expanding or contracting a base map through photocopying or any of the, the base, the, the bar graph will expand at the same rate as the expansion or contraction of your of the map that you're expanding or contracting. So when we're calculating a scale from a graphic scale, we always have to use the word approximately before the fraction because it's all based on our perception of the scale and where it marks. So it's always approximate. Tools to help with graphic scales. If you have a natural scale indicator or a scale finder, I have a picture of a scale finder there. Um, these are incredibly helpful because it saves the amount of math, math, math we have to do. Um, on the paper scale finder on one side, it, we've got one degree of latitude and a thousand feet. On the other side, it has one mile and a thousand feet. So, and when you're using a ruler, you can use either inches or centimeters on the ruler, depending on the measurement given on the map. Obviously, the, the graphic scale is in kilometers. You want to use centimeters just because the math will be easier. Uh, if it's miles, you use inches. Then you'll find where a mark on the graphic scale on the map comes closest to the mark on the ruler. And then you do a calculation to determine the scale. So here, got a scale in miles. And you can see kind of hard to read, but this whole length is one mile. So the mark for one mile is just a bit beyond the five inch mark on my ruler. It's about halfway between five inches and five sixteenths of an inch when you look at it. So I divide 63,360 by 5.3, and so I'd record the scale as approximately 1 to 12,596 feet. Oh, yeah, 1 to 12,596. Using the natural scale indicator, again, you place the baseline at the zero mark on the graph using the column corresponding to the unit of measurement on the map. Find where a mark on the graphic scale comes close to the mark on the scale indicator where the marks come close to each other, doesn't correspond on the link to be read, math will have to be done. Because what you what mark you select might have a bearing on the result. This is why we use the term approximately in the scale statement. So here we have, once again, my there's my baseline lined up on zero and the one mile mark falls somewhere between 12,500 and 12,600. So I'm going to record the scale as one to approximately 12,550. Both of these scale statements are correct because it, it's going to depend on how you calculate the scale. But now you see why we use the approximately and why I keep saying it that we have to use that for the scale statement. Okay. If there are lines of latitude on the scale, on the map, but there are no other ways to calculate scale, you can use the lines of latitude to determine the scale. If you're using a ruler, the formula is N over 11 million. N is the number of centimeters measured on the map for one degree of latitude. And 11, million is the approximate number of centimeters on the ground for one degree of latitude. So you divide the numerator and the denominator by n, giving you one to the left of the column and 11 million divided by n to the right. 
Or if you're using the scale finder or natural scale indicator, use the column to be read on one degree of latitude, place the baseline on the line of latitude, find the mark on the indicator that comes closest to the line of latitude, and do any math that needs to be done to determine the scale. So here I've got a map. There's my line of latitude. And there's, we don't have, I suppose I could try to figure it out based on that, but here's what I did was I went and I used the line that crossed the, at the 15 degree mark. So from zero to 15 degrees is 4.75 centimeters according to my eyesight. So dividing 11 million by 4.75 gives us 2,315,789. Since we, this is for 15 degrees, I need to multiply that number to give us this number, which I'm not going to try to say, oops. Going back to our, using the scale indicator, we go, uh, Again, put the baseline on, on zero degrees and then come down and see where the 15 crosses. The line for 15 degrees of latitude seems to be at the 2,300,000 mark on the scale indicator. And again, multiplying that by 15 gives us 34 million. 34,500,000. So I'm saying scale approximately that at the equator. Again, both of these scales are correct. And I had to throw in the fact that there was a scale at the equator because the map is Mercator projection. And that's one of the projections where the uh, lines of latitude actually get further apart the farther you get away from the equator. So that's why I had to specify that that was the scale at the equator. Um, so uh, that we can, we have other scale statements that we can use. Um, one is scale varies, and we use this when the scale of a single map varies across the map, and the outside values are not known. Uh, if the outside values are known. We can record both scales in the single scale statement right, with the more detailed scale first and the uh, larger scale later, or the smaller scale later. Um, this is fairly common. There was a, at least one German map company that for tourist maps would give a greater detail for the map in the center part of town where people, you know, where the tourists are going to be interested in. And once they get out to the suburbs, they didn't give that much detail. So that's that's an example of one of those. Scales differ can be used when there are two or more maps of equal importance on the sheet or in the set, and the scales are not the same. Or if you prefer, you can do a separate scale statement for each scale being used in either the map, on the maps or in the set. Scale not given, we use when there is only, the only way to determine the scale is to compare the map that you have to a map that has a known scale. And the cut library policy is not to do so because what you end up having to do is find the same place on both maps. You taking the distance from the scale, the map of known scale, and then comparing the link to the map of unknown scale. And then once again, doing that to get it to, to figure out what the scale is of the map of unknown scale. Scale indeterminable. You use this only when there is truly no way to determine the scale using one of the other methods, including the comparison method. So this is not used very often. Um, you, yeah, uh, excuse me. It's usually only when 
you have the only map of the area. You only have one map of the area, so you don't have a map to compare it to. Um, it's just, just not, you don't see it very much. Also not drawn to scale is the last scale statement that gets used and it's used for bird's eye views, map views, maps of imaginary places, celestial charts, and other maps of nonlinear scales, which do not get scale information and which are not drawn to scale. The maps in our ALA programs of the hotels are not drawn to scale ever. <laughs> So I'm actually under time. So we'll uh, move on to the next session. All right, thank you very much, Susan. So our lightning talk for this session, our, finally, our final talk of the day, we've got Zachary Fannin from the University of Minnesota to speak with us about Minnesota's missing parks, a look at some subject and class discrepancies. Zach, I'm seeing your screen just fine. So whenever you are ready. Okay, can you can you hear me fine? Yes, you're coming through just fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, just repeat, um, uh, my name is Zachary Fannin, Zach. I'm the map cataloger at the University of Minnesota, and I thought to end the day on a lighter note just by taking a look at a few gaps I found between the Library of Congress subject headings and the Library of Congress classification system while I was working on a set of, or excuse me, a set of Minnesota State Park Mac several months ago. Uh, the Library of Congress subject headings manual states, quote, both the classification number and the first subject heading assigned to a work are based on the predominant topic of the work. However, it does not always, or excuse me, it is not always possible to achieve an exact match because the classification system and the subject heading system have different conventions. Therefore, the principle that the first subject heading match the class number is somewhat flexible. We do try to match up things with geographic headings as well, but as the manual suggests, flexibility is needed at times. LCSH and LCC follow separate procedures and understandably so, but at times, some geographic headings last, lack a class correlate. Again, heading and class proposals are separate processes and do not appear to mention correlation as standard practice. This does not preclude, however, proposing a heading and a class in tandem which would seem to be reasonable in the cases of maps. The reverse is also true as some classes go without direct subject correlates. Creating geographic headings doesn't necessarily warrant an LC number to cover the place. Either the class isn't needed for the resource at hand or the resource might cover something broader with several narrow headings and the general topic is adequately indicated by an existing classification, <clears throat> excuse me. An example might be a resource discussing Minnesota state parks in general or collectively. Despite this, it may be wise to consider submitting LCSH LCC proposals in tandem when appropriate, and it may be so for state parks. Uh, here's a map of Minnesota state park system with three parks I've highlighted for quick examples. They include Glacial Lake State Park located in West Central Minnesota, which lacks a subject heading, Beaver Creek Valley State Park in the southeast corner, which lacks a class, and Interstate Park, or Interstate State Park, uh, which is a tad more complicated. Uh, so to see an example of a subject without a correlating class, we'll take a look at Beaver Creek Valley State Park. Here we see it has a subject heading, but nothing where its counterpart in the LCC would be. A possible explanation is that at the time the heading was proposed, a corresponding uh, class was not needed for the resource at hand. For example, it might have been a book on the botanical history of the park, not primarily concerned with cartographic or geographic properties. Uh, now let's look take a look at a reverse situation with Glacial Lake State Park. In the case of this park, we have a class without a subject. Um, now, how a class might be proposed without an equivalent heading is a bit more puzzling to me, and I would love to hear anyone who knows better than I what situation might present that. 
And then there's Interstate Park or Interstate State Park. Uh, a bit of confusion arose when I was working on a map of this park and not only from the name. Adjacent to this park, just across the St. Croix River and the Minnesota-Wisconsin border, is an anonymous park that, with its Minnesota counterpart, forms the collective Interstate Park. Um, the jurisdiction of the collective park is unclear to me, but history says that the formation of the two parks was a joint legislative effort, resulting in the first interstate parkland collaboration in U.S. history, which, if nothing else, I found to be a cool piece of trivia to learn and something to keep in your back pocket for jeopardy. Uh, for quick context, Interstate Park lies about 50 miles north-northeast of the Twin Cities, near the dials of the St. Croix River State Natural Area. So what does this mean for catalogs? Well, it means we'll need to be sure of the exact coverage when we encounter a map with any of these geographic elements. Firstly, the official name for each of the state's respective site of the river is Interstate State Park, but in LCSH, for its only entry for the Wisconsin side, it simply calls it Interstate Park, Wisconsin. Fortunately, each state park does have a class in LCC, However, there is none for the collective interstate park. So in the LCSH, we find ourselves with Interstate Park Wisconsin, but no Minnesota counterpart, and then Interstate Park, um, which lacks both an LCSC and LCSH entry. So what's a cataloger to do? Well, in situations like these, we will likely have to zoom out and use a heading or a class for an area containing the relevant excuse me, relevant coverage. On the left, we have a regional map showing the Twin Cities and Chisago County circled just north northeast of it. On the right, we zoom in to see Chisago County with Interstate Park's location at the very southeast tip, again, along the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. We see the classification string leading us precisely where we'd like to go for Interstate State Park, Minnesota, but no equivalent in the subject headings. Instead, we choose the next best thing, Chisago County, as the primary coverage area, which, as we saw, is notably larger but fully contains the park. Taylor's Falls, a town in Minnesota adjacent to the park, might be worth considering, but it may also conf excuse me, it may also confuse users since the map doesn't display the town name and it's not entirely relevant to the resource. In sum, recall that. In general subject cataloging, we want to begin with the narrowest heading that does not abbreviate a resource's primary topic. In the case of maps, its primary geographic subject heading should not exclude significant parts of the area covered. This may at times require the cataloger to select a heading that seems too broad, but is nonetheless the narrowest to include all the resources coverage. In the case of the Minnesota State Parks maps, when a heading for a particular park was lacking, I usually selected the county containing the park. On occasion, this may have called for recording two counties with which the park significantly overlapped. In the end, the best procedure I found was to choose a heading or class that did the resource justice, hopefully without leading a patron astray. And then here were, are the ultimate choices I made regarding the subject heading and the class, Chisago County, Minnesota, and G4142I5 respectively. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Zach. And now we have plenty of time left for questions. It looks like folks have been having some conversation in the chat, but if you have questions, you can either type them in the chat and either um, Tim or I will read them out or you can raise your hand and be and um, unmute yourself. I can jump in with maybe some speculation. Oh, <laughs> Zach, your time is up. <laughs> I can maybe, uh, I, I have a hazy memory of reading or hearing somewhere that at some point 
the Library of Congress made contact. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is a question for uh, with regards to or a comment with regards to Zach's uh, presentation. Um, I remember hearing that the Library of Congress had contact had sort of identified a contact in each state who agreed to build out the Library of Congress classification schedule for the, the G schedule for that state, the sort of filling out all of the towns, all of, you know, using their own judgment in um, determining which uh, parks and other entities to assign subject uh, classification codes to. And so I think that might account for why there are so many in there that do not have corresponding subject headings, I think, but I don't know for sure because I, I'm i I'm communicating hearsay, <laughs> so I'm not sure um, if I have that exactly right, but that, that I have the same experience with, as you when I catalog that there are a lot of uh, little itty bitty towns in Michigan that have they they have a classification for a map of that town, but nobody has even created a, na a name authority record for that town. I think that might be the source of the discrepancy, but I'm not sure. And I have raised my hand to verify that yes, that that I I've heard that I have heard that same hearsay, but in 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 my instance, I believe it was the former, former, former map cataloger or map librarian here at the University of Northern Iowa that did the Iowa uh, headers for towns and parks and things. So it may be for, for interstate, one of the reasons it may not be there is maybe the park was formed after that project. It's a theory. That is cool to know. Thank you very much, Tim and Susan. If, if I could chime in too for history buffs, uh, that that is kind of what I heard and what I learned below these many years ago when I was uh, in 2001 when I was at the summer thing at LC and that there were people, their complaint at the time was that people were creating cutters for maps that didn't exist. The places existed, but there were no maps. Uh, so for a, of a small state park, for example, or a small municipal park. Uh, the other thing is, you know, LC for their cutter schedule, they have that uh, PDF, but I could not confirm or deny that that is ever updated. Um, uh, you know, for example, the, in Colorado, we created a, a new county, 15 years ago, I don't think it's uh, marked as city county on the list. There is a process to update them. Uh, you get to you uh, actually get to bypass the uh, ordinary process for proposing a Library of Congress classification. You can uh, and I can. Uh, Chris, I can shoot you an email if you if you're ever interested, uh, you can I you can write directly to the uh, geography and map division with the code that you wish to assign and they will help you uh they'll help yes. you out yes please if you could probably send that out to all of us because i'm okay. sure there's, there's many of us map cataloging geeks that would have a you know a laundry list to send them so we'll do Hi, uh, this is uh, Tammy, Tammy Wong from uh, Library of Congress, Geography and Map Division. And uh, yes, um, we do uh, update the classification web, um, city cutters and so on and so forth. Um, it, and also, um, you know, as a few years ago, we got rid of the paper schedule, but um, for the PDF G schedule, we do have um, the, just the main schedule, but not including the uh, the city cutters and the county cutters, et cetera, those um, you have to consult the classification web online. Thank you, Tama. I'm glad you're here. You're you're often the person responding when I when I, when I send in my submissions. <laughs> yes, please consent continue to send send it to us. Um, thank you.
All right. Any other questions, comments? Just to follow Others? up, this is Min. Uh, if you need a classification cutter for place name, just send to mapcat at lc.gov. And the, what uh, our workflow is, uh, yeah, Tammy is the main main person to uh, input all the classifications, but uh, each cataloger is um, assigned for a specific area. So they will be familiar with that, supposed to be familiar with that region or country. So um, when we receive a request, we assign to the cataloger who is assigned to that region. So that, uh, I think when Tim submitted uh, all his requests, uh, fortunately, mostly fall um, under Tammy's um, responsibility. Well, thank you so much. I hope that clarifies the, uh, you know, the situation. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Min and Tammy. Good to see you here. Sure. We learned a lot. <laughs> Okay, so going once, going twice before I pass it back to Tim to wrap us up for the day. Yes, thank you so much to Tim for getting this started, getting it all together. Thank you all of y'all for showing up. This has been a great turnout. And actually, this is probably the stuff that Tim was looking to say. So Tim, you're up. <laughs> yes, <I will. laughs> thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our presenters, our moderators, and our attendees. I've learned so much today, and I'm so grateful to everyone for sharing your research and your expertise. Um, if you are not a McGirt member, uh, we uh, encourage you to join us. Let me put the website link in the chat. We're easy to find on Google. Uh, like many library organizations after the pandemic, we are looking to build our volunteer base uh, so we can maximize our effectiveness uh, in supporting our profession. Um, if you are attending ALA in uh, ALA annual in San Diego this June, uh, please look for us. Uh, we'll have programming and social events, and we'd love to see you. Um, with all that, uh, oh, there's Paige, recently retired, uh, uh, enjoying uh, his, uh, he's, he's all the leisure time in the world, and he's, he's coming to a McGirt conference. <laughs> so uh, thank you again, everybody, and uh, until next time.